This is audible. Dead Woman Walking Written by Sharon Bolton and read by Julia Barry Chapter 1 This woman, Jessica Lane, should have died. Eleven people were killed in that crash. Not only did Lane survive, she walked away. She's still walking. So, I want to know where she's going. I want to know why she hasn't been in touch, why she isn't seeking help, why she's deliberately avoiding the police. I want to know who she's running from. Most of all, I want her found. Part 1 Chapter 2 Wednesday the 20th of September The balloon hung in the air like an inverted Christmas bauble its voluptuous candy-striped sphere reflected perfectly in the lake. In the early light the water glowed with the colours of a ripe peach, pale gold towards its edges, a deeper, richer pink at its heart. There was no wind, no sound. The trees along the shoreline had ceased their pre-dawn rustling, and none of the balloon's thirteen passengers was either moving or speaking. The world seemed to be holding its breath. Below, as far as the passengers could see in every direction, lay the heather-swept moorland of the Northumberland National Park. Acres of grasses rippled like a pelt of a huge waking animal. Streams shimmered like silver snakes, and the burning sunrise set the hilltops on fire. The landscape was vast, wild, unchanged in hundreds of years, as though the balloon had become a time machine floating them back to when the far north of England was home to even fewer people than it is now. They could see no roads, no train lines, no towns or villages. But for the thirteen of them, the world seemed empty. The basket was large and rectangular, as is common with pleasure flights, and subdivided into four sections to restrict on-board movement of the passengers. The pilot had his own space in the centre of the rectangle. In one of the compartments were two women in their mid to late thirties, one wearing black, the other green. The two were not quite alike enough to be twins, but obviously sisters. The one in black breathed out a soft bubble of sound, too audible to be a sigh, too happy to be a moan. You're welcome. The sister in green smiled. The sisters were sharing their compartment with an accountant from Dunstable. His wife and two teenage children were in the one adjacent. On the other side of the pilot were three men on a hiking holiday, dressed like traffic lights in red, orange and green anoraks, a middle-aged couple from Scotland and a retired journalist. The basket continued its slow, lazy spiral as they drifted above the lake. The constant movement had been one of the biggest surprises of the experience, as had the feel of the air at altitude. It was sharper somehow, and fresher than it ever felt on the ground. Cool, but not uncomfortably so in the way that frosty mornings are. The air tingled against the skin, fizzed its way down to the lungs. The woman in green, Jessica, edged closer to her sister whose face had grown pale and whose hands were clutching the rim of the basket. Her eyes, staring directly down at the water's surface, were wide with wonder. Jessica was suddenly disturbed by the most alarming thought, that her sister might be about to jump out. A short while later, she was to think it might have been better if both of them had jumped, that one or two petrifying seconds and a painful encounter with the water's surface wouldn't have been so bad. The cool, choking blackness might have finished them off, but equally might have buoyed them up and carried them to shore. Had they leapt at that point, they might both have lived. Isn't it fabulous? she said, because she'd learned a long time ago that distraction could sometimes halt a reckless course of action on her sister's part. 
Are you enjoying it? I can't believe we never did this before. Isabel smiled but said nothing, because a reply would have been pointless. She was clearly besotted with the whole experience. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Look at those colours. Still no reply. But Jessica had the satisfaction of seeing her sister lift her head and beam at the trees growing right to the edge of the water. They were like ladies at a ball, jostling for space, their floating gowns trailing down, twisting together, until it was impossible to tell where one ended and another began. Beyond the trees, the hills, glowing like precious metals, went on forever. We're now above the Harcourt Estate. From takeoff, the pilot had been the only one to speak above a whisper. The original house was built on the rise directly ahead, but destroyed by fire in the late 19th century. Do we need a bit more height? The retired journalist, with the thinning hair and thickening waistline, was frowning at the rapidly approaching trees. Don't worry, folks. I've done this before. The six-foot red-haired Geordie pilot tickled the air above the burner with a short burst of flame, and those closest to him felt the oven blast of hot air on their heads. I like to stay low at this point, because these woods are one of the best places in Northumberland to see red squirrels. Also, whilst it's a bit late in the year, ospreys. There was a sudden flurry of camera activity, and a pressing towards the side of the basket closest to the woods. Neither of the sisters had brought a camera, so they were the first to see the ruined upper sections of the house come into view, rising from the tree canopy like badly stained teeth. The sister in black shuddered. The 16th century house was built here for defensive purposes, said the pilot as the balloon rose a little to skirt the treetops. Back then, you'd get an uninterrupted view of nearly fifty miles of countryside. Fifteen minutes from landing, folks. Is that one? Top of the wide tree with the yellow leaves? Greyish-brown feathers? One of the hikers was pointing back towards the treetops, and the focus of attention shifted away from the house. Could be. The pilot raised his binoculars, turning his back on the direction of travel. There's someone down there. Where? In the woods. Jessica followed her sister's gaze, but her own eyesight had never been as good. Isabel's hearing was better, too, and she had always been the first to pick up scents, to detect the strange flavours in food, as though she were the sharper, clearer forged of the two. Behind the house. Jessica stood on tiptoe. Over her sister's shoulder she could see the great gaping holes in the roof, the collapsing walls. A girl! Running! Low enough to make out tiny pillows of moss and broken roof slates, the balloon passed over the house. The pilot, distracted by his attempt to spot an osprey, had allowed them to fall lower still. There! A darting figure. A young woman, slim and dark-haired, wearing blue clothes that had an eastern look about them, had reached the far wall of the garden. What's she doing? Behind them, others were trying to photograph the osprey, and the journalist was advising on how best to capture wildlife. Only the two sisters were watching the girl on the ground. Jessica glanced round, unsure whether to alert the others or not. Reaching into the pocket of her jacket, she found her phone. Down in the garden, from around a line of bushes, a man came walking, slowly but purposefully. From above, the two sisters could only make out his build, short but stocky. He wore an oversized leather jacket and a dark trilby, white shirt. His dark hair curled down below the rim of the hat. Trotting along by his side was a large German shepherd. Oh! Jessica pressed even closer to her sister. Bella, hold still, let me just... At the sight of the man, 
The girl cowered down, her hands clasped tight above her head. What? said Isabel. I don't believe it. It is him. Who? Jess, do you know that man? Sean? Jessica reached back, touched the pilot's arm. You need to see this. What is it? He turned their way, so did the accountant. He's got a gun. The accountant's teenage son had spotted the pair on the ground, was pointing to what appeared to be a rifle or shotgun in the man's left hand. In his right he had a large stone. Oh, my God, he has, said the teenager's mother. What do we do? They were still talking in shrill whispers. Others in the basket had lost interest in the osprey, and more heads were turning their way. The girl on the ground looked up, saw the balloon, and began to scream. The man, who hadn't seen them or heard them yet, raised the stone high. The girl seemed to be trying to press herself into the ground. The man brought the stone down. The girl didn't scream again. The strangled cry, perfectly audible in the dawn air, came from someone in the balloon. It was the only sound they made. Shock held them tight. The man on the ground turned and looked up. His dog did the same. The dog began to bark. The passengers in the balloon saw the man drop the rock and lift a hand to his head, holding his hat in place as he craned his neck and stared upwards. Oh, Christ, said Jessica. The air around them roared as Sean opened the valve and released the flame but he told them in the briefing that up to ten seconds' delay would follow any action on his part. It could be ten seconds before the balloon was rising properly. Isabel, probably remembering the same thing, was counting softly. Ten. Nine. Jessica brought her phone up, flicked a camera mode and took the man's picture. He saw her do it. For a second he stared directly into her eyes. Eight. Seven. The man on the ground passed the gun into his right hand. Get down! Everyone down! Jessica pushed her sister below the rim of the basket and dropped down herself, reaching back to tug on the accountant's arm. Unable to duck completely, there simply wasn't room for all of them to kneel in the basket. She left her eyes pinned on the man below, the top of her head dangerously exposed. His dog was running in excited circles now, barking up at the strange thing in the sky. Six, five, counted Isabel. Jessica thought perhaps they were rising, but slowly. People were still on their feet. Get down! She tried again. Another flame burst upwards, just as the man on the ground raised his gun. The sounds of terror erupted into the still dawn air. Passengers began to scream, to shout to each other, to the pilot. As the accountant reached across, pushing his family below its brim, the basket began to turn, taking the two sisters further away from the drama on the ground. Four, three. They were definitely going up, faster now. Hold tight! Sean burned a third time. Two, one. In her head, Jessica counted another second. Then another. Yes, they were climbing quickly now. The balloon passed beyond the walled perimeter of the garden, gaining height with every second. Oh, thank God. Quick, take us up. Oh, my God. Everyone, keep your heads down. The basket swung back, and she could see the garden again. Through an archway where a sturdy wooden door would have once hung, the man on the ground had stepped out into the open space behind the house. Jessica brought her phone up and took his picture again. A clear shot this time. Unfortunately, he had the same. Heads down! Heads down! She had no idea who was shouting. She thought it was probably the pilot. But she couldn't move. Couldn't duck completely below the basket rim. She continued to stare at the man who was holding the rifle, had the butt tucked against his shoulder, was steadying himself against the wall. 
He was aiming at her. She was sure of it. The shot, so loud, so clear, and so very, very close, was followed by several seconds of shocked silence. Then low mutterings and a stifled moan. The teenage girl began to sob. The balloon was rising very fast now, the ground shrinking away. Already the two figures, one coiled like a felled snake, the other striding fast along the rise of land as though it might catch him, were becoming indistinct. In the corner of her eye, Jessica saw another head appear over the rim. She could hear movement, scrabbling against the rattan framework of the basket. The other passengers were getting to their feet. Her sister pushed and she leaned back, allowing her to rise. Did that really happen? I can't believe that just happened. Is everyone all right? Helen, Poppy, Nathan, talk to me. The man on the ground raised his rifle again, and the basket swung as people ducked for cover. This time the two sisters stayed where they were. They were very high now, probably as high as they'd been since the trip started, and several hundred metres away. They must be safe. Is there a signal up here? The journalist was still below the rim of the basket. We need to call the police. Jessica had already checked her phone. Nothing. There was little or no signal in the Northumberland National Park. It remained one of the most remote, sparsely populated, least accessible regions of the country. Heads began appearing again. The accountant, who'd introduced himself earlier as Harry, reached out for his wife, who had one arm around each of her children. People, visibly shaken, were looking down at the rise of land, the ruined house, the autumn patchwork of woodland. The lake was still shining in the dawn light like a discarded penny. It seemed a long way away. It's okay. Everybody be calm. Nat, are you all right? It's over. We're too far away now. I can't even see him anymore. Jesus wept. Did I really see that? Jessica could feel tension settling as terror gave way to relief. She checked her phone again. Down on the ground was a woman who couldn't get away. Someone with a different network might have more luck. She opened her mouth to ask them all to check their phones. The screaming thumped against the side of her head like a hammer blow. As one, the passengers turned towards the sound. On the other side of the basket stood a middle-aged schoolteacher called Natalie. Her screaming continued, her hands clamped tight to her face. Her husband clutched her shoulders, trying to turn her face towards himself. The other passengers looked at her, followed her eye line, and saw immediately that something was missing, and that its absence spelled disaster. Sean, the big red-haired pilot, was no longer standing upright in his separate compartment in the middle of the basket, one hand on the burner valve, the other clutching his binoculars. Those closest to him craned forward, as though he too might be cowering out of sight. The teenage boy was pulled back by his father. A male hiker turned away, revulsion on his face. What? Where is he? Where's he gone? Jessica pressed closer and stood on tiptoe to see over the accountant's shoulder, then raised her phone again and began taking photographs. The interior of the pilot's compartment looked as though someone had shaken a lidless can of red paint around. Blood and a glutinous grey slime dripped down the rattan sides. In the bottom of the basket was slumped a tangle of limbs and torso. The pilot's head had been shot clean from his body. Chapter 3 Taking out the pilot with a single shot had been one of the most satisfying experiences of his life. Patrick felt his entire body tingling with excitement, energy coursing through his veins as though it had been tasered into him. Now, though, he had his sight upon the dark-haired woman in the green jacket. He took a breath, held it, and felt his trigger finger glow. She was staring straight at him dumb as a rabbit, and in a split second her brains would be spraying through the air like a firework. 
he felt the familiar stirring in his groin, at knowing the hunt was coming to an end, and in the middle of his chest the outline of the crucifix burned through his shirt and into his skin. But the freaking basket was spinning again, taking the woman's head out of sight, partially obscuring it behind one of the balloon's strong supporting wires, and with every passing second they were getting higher in the sky. Other heads began to appear, darting below the rim again when they caught sight of him. He counted six, eight, maybe more. Very little time left now. Shut it, Shento! He aimed a kick at the dog. It dodged him with the skill of long practice. He could shoot the basket. The woven material wouldn't hold back bullets. They could take out most of them simply by peppering it. There, the cleanest, tidiest shot he'd ever get. She was looking directly at him again, had even raised herself up, was staring down at him, almost as though she knew him. He pulled gently on the trigger and stopped. He could not shoot any more of them. Even one might have been too many. This had to look like an accident. The rest would have to die on impact. No problem. Actually, a lot more fun. Patrick lowered the gun, watched as the balloon sailed out of reach, and then pulled out his phone. No signal. There never was a signal out here. None of them would be calling for help or reporting the incident any time soon. From close behind, a low moan reminded him he wasn't done here yet. He walked back into the garden, the dog at his heels. The girl on the ground still had a pulse, but it was faint. She was bleeding from the cut on her head, and possibly also from one ear. He lifted a strand of black hair, leaned low and pressed it to his face. It smelled of oil and sweat, and when he let it fall in disgust, her eyes opened. She couldn't focus. Her eyes were black but there was no gleam in them any more. She moaned, but made no attempt to move. He watched her for three minutes that he couldn't spare. He arranged her long hair until it covered her face, but didn't bring his fingers up to his nose again. The colour was right. The colour was what he liked, but the smell was wrong. He stepped back, looking at the outline of her thin body beneath the dirty clothes, and had thoughts that, according to his ma, would send him straight to hell. Time was running on. Shouldering his gun, he ran across the garden through the ruined house and back out the front. His quad bike was waiting. He tucked his hat into a pocket, turned on the ignition and steered around the front of the house. Shinto followed. He could keep up with the bike all day if he had to. Chapter 4 Shock had wrapped itself around the balloon, like a chill wind. The hiker in the far corner of the basket was shouting instructions that nobody could properly hear. The teenage boy using his phone to take pictures of the dead pilot was a mass of jumpy, nervous movement. His father, by contrast, seemed frozen in place. The mother and daughter were locked tight together as far from the dead man as they could get. Natalie was clinging to her husband and yelling that she had to get down, they had to get down, that she really couldn't cope with any more and could they please get her down now. Below them, the earth had lost most of its colour, all of its shine. Almost from nowhere, heavy clouds had massed in the sky, draining the park of its beauty. Now it looked desolate and empty, a place from which no help could come. The balloon was still rising, picking up speed, its shadow racing along the ground. The air around them was colder, too. The gentle tingling against the skin of the first part of the flight had given way to the harsh nip of almost winter mornings. For the first time since they'd taken off, Jessica experienced the dull ache of nausea. A cold hand closed gently around hers. What do we do? Isabel asked. 
on the other side of the pilot's compartment. The three hikers were on their feet, pale but composed. The journalist, too. We need a new pilot. Jessica willed her voice not to show the terror she was feeling. It's not a fighter jet. We go up, we go down. How hard can it be? One of the hikers, a man called Nigel, said, I'm a mechanical engineer. Anyone think they're better qualified? Somebody do something now, wailed Natalie. I don't want to die. Nobody's going to die. The hiker in red, Walter, was a loud man, a man who spoke and laughed noisily. Being scared was making him louder. We have plenty of time, the journalist Martin said. We can get up to something like ten thousand feet before we need oxygen. The important thing is not to panic. Such wise words, so hard to obey. Panic had swooped down from above like a giant bird of prey. Jessica didn't want to look up in case she saw it, perched on the supporting framework above their heads, leering down, waiting for their control to break. She glanced over the side instead. The landscape below didn't seem to be getting smaller. Give me a leg up, Walt. Nigel reached up to grasp the leather-covered uprights. Natalie broke away from her husband and began screaming, hurling her terror out into the thinning air. Shut up! The last of the three hikers, Bob, pointed at Natalie's husband. You, shut her up! All of you, shut up now, or I'll throw you overboard myself! An angry red face looked back at him. There's no need for that. We should all try to be calm, Jessica heard her sister say. I know we're frightened, but there are lots of things we can do. They listened to Isabel. Screams were stifled, sobs held back. The new calm was fragile, though, like a bubble made from soap. It could burst at any second. Nigel, dangerously exposed, wobbled on the brink of the pilot's compartment. His face was ashen as he dropped down. Shit! He turned back to his two mates. I can't see a bloody thing in here. We have to get rid of Sean. Walter stared. What do you mean, get rid of him? Look at him! As those closest pressed forward, Bob did something that seemed stupidly daring. He took hold of the uprights that held the basket to the balloon and jumped up so that he was sitting on the basket's rim. Everyone looked down. The space in the centre of the basket was tiny, built for one person to stand upright. The pilot had been a big man. Slumped in death, he took up the entire floor space. We have to throw him over. We can't do that. Lie him down. It won't work. We won't be able to move. Martin said, Get him into this basket. A fresh wail from Natalie. Don't bring him in with us. I couldn't bear it. The journalist turned on her. We can't just drop him. For God's sake, he's dead. He couldn't be more dead. Jessica had to say something. We're not rising any more, she called. In fact, we've lost quite a bit of height. Whatever we do, we have to do it quickly. Bob jumped down from the rim. Natalie has a point. This is no time for sentiment. We have to get rid of him. Walter said, I'll climb over, Nigel. Give you a hand. Nigel nodded. Martin, are you okay to help? Ladies, I'm sorry to ask, but I might need you to shove his legs and feet. No problem, said Jessica. As Walter began to climb over to join Nigel, Jessica couldn't help glancing over the side again. The ground was an awful lot closer. Was that a good thing, or... Don't look, said her sister quietly in her ear. We've got time. He's a big bloke. Nigel and Walter were bent over in the pilot's compartment. Martin, grab an arm and pull when I say. OK, guys? And lift. The three men heaved. The pilot was heavy in death, but they got his torso over the rim and then gravity took over. Wait! 
Jessica yelled. Too late. One final heave and the pilot's legs scraped over the rattan, and he slid out of sight. The balloon responded immediately to the lost weight. It went up, faster than it had previously, swimming up towards the thickening cloud. Fresh wails broke out from all sides. Up they went. What's happening? someone shouted. We've lost the pilot's weight, Jessica yelled. He was a big man. The balloon was bound to react. It'll sort itself out. Hold on and don't panic. Easy to say when the seaside rock colours of the balloon seemed to be growing bigger and brighter above them. In the pilot space, Nigel was looking at the variometer, the one instrument in the basket that was clipped to an upright. He stared as though willing it to stop showing ever higher numbers. Christ! I should have thought of that! He ran a hand over his face, leaving behind red smudges from the pilot's blood. We're nearly at two thousand feet, he said. It's not a problem, Jessica shouted. We were very low over the house. There's a lot of sky above us. It'll sort itself out. She turned to look at the scared faces. We're getting an unexpected lesson in physics. I think it's slowing already. It wasn't. They were still rising quickly. But the filthy black bird above them had spread its wings. She could feel its shadow cloaking them its vile stench settling. She's right, the journalist yelled. We can't go up indefinitely. I did some reading before I booked this trip. Also, the terminal velocity of a balloon like this is roughly 800 feet per minute. What the hell's that got to do with anything? said Bob. That's about the same as an old-fashioned parachute. The journalist looked across at the sisters. It means we won't die, ladies. We might break a few bones, but even if all we do now is drift back to Earth, we should be okay. There really is no need to panic, and no jumping out at any point or the balloon will fly up again. Around the basket, faces creased in concentration as people processed his words and tried to understand them. Thanks, Martin, said Nigel. Well, you use a radio on the boat. See if you can figure out how to work this one. We need to let people on the ground know what's happening and get some help. They can talk us down. It can't be that hard. Does anyone have a signal? Jessica was holding up her phone, trying to catch the attention of the others. We still need to get help for the woman on the ground if we can. We need to get the police looking for that guy. Phones will be quicker than waiting for Walter to work the radio. Can you all check, please? Nigel dug into his pocket and handed over a slim phone. Jessica shook her head in frustration. Ah, same as mine. Anyone on anything other than orange? People were taking out their phones, holding them up, waving them around, tapping them against the side of the basket. Keep trying, please. We have to get in range sometime. Nigel, still staring at the variometer, was breathing heavily, as though he'd just run a race. Okay he said. One of the last things Sean told us was that we were fifteen minutes from landing, so we must be close. He glanced over the side. What I need you to do, ladies and gents, is be my lookouts. Look for the ground crew, for a suitable landing site, somewhere big and flat. Most importantly, look for obstacles. We don't want to go flying into a big tree or a mountain. I can't actually see a radio at the moment. Walter muttered. Anyone know what it should look like? Jessica glanced up from her phone. The old house will be our best landmark. The old Harcourt estate. There's nothing else in view. We just need to work out how far we've travelled. She checked her watch. Twelve minutes since we passed over the house. I'd say we've got about two miles. Nigel had one hand on a red-painted metal valve. If I'm right, this will release the gas and send us up. When no one objected, he turned the valve. A burst of flame shot into the air. No! Don't take us up! We need to go down! I need to figure out how it works. Nigel fired the burner again. Stop it! Take us down! Am I going blind? 
Walter was on his knees, and only the two sisters heard him. They looked at each other. Hush, love. He knows what he's doing, said Natalie's husband. No, he doesn't. He hasn't a clue. None of us have. There is no radio in this balloon. Jessica mouthed the words, making no sound, but feeling them echo around her head all the same. Above her, the bird with its rotting black feathers opened its beak and screeched down at them. The balloon responded to the hot air and began rising. There is no radio in this balloon. Walter repeated her words quietly, glancing up at the two sisters. There must be. Jessica said. We all heard Sean using it. I've got a signal! The teenage boy was holding his phone up high, twisting it around in the air, as though trying to capture the elusive signal. It's faint, though. Only one bar. Call 999, Jessica snapped at him. Tell them what's happening. They'll know what to do. Give it to me if you have any problems. Walter, what's that over there behind that canvas? Nigel spoke to the journalist. Martin, the fire extinguisher's next to you. When we land, one of the biggest dangers is going to be fire. So I want you to figure out how to use it. Right, don't set it off too soon. Right you are, replied the journalist. Oh, my God! We're not going to burn, are we? I can't burn! Someone please shut her up! Natalie's husband had one hand wrapped tight around the uprights. She's scared, OK? We all are. Yeah, well, some of us are trying to be constructive. I've lost the signal again, the teenage boy said. Sorry, guys. Keep trying. Jessica was intent on her own phone. Everyone keep trying. We have to get a signal sometime. We're too high. The mother and the teenage girl were locked together. Don't send us any higher. OK, I won't. Nigel gave them a nervous smile. I think I've figured out how the vent works. We pull on this coloured line here. So I'm going to let us drift lower now. I'll only use the burner if I think we're descending too quickly. He wrapped his hand around a coloured cord, hesitated for a second, and then pulled. There was an audible intake of breath, and then everyone looked up to see that the central circle of the balloon had collapsed down, revealing a ring of daylight in the top. As Nigel released the cord, it vanished. Jessica started to count to ten in her head. At eight, the balloon began to sink. In the pilot space, Nigel gave a little grunt of satisfaction. Everyone, I want you to keep looking round. Don't look at me. Don't look at the balloon. We need to spot that ground crew. If you have phones, I want you to use them. Nathan, is it any luck yet? Not yet. The teenager looked up briefly. It keeps cutting out. I'm going to try a text. How are we doing with the radio, Walt? I would really use some advice from the ground. Dad, said the teenage girl. Keep trying, Nathan. Did anyone get photographs of that bastard back at the house? Dad, said the girl a bit louder this time. I did. Martin held his phone aloft. Good. Post them on Twitter, Instagram or something. People need to know what happened. What are you doing? Jessica heard her sister's voice in her ear. Sending Neil the password for my laptop, she replied. Lot of important stuff on it. She looked up and forced a smile at her sister's worried face. Just being cautious, you know me. Nige, I really don't think there's a radio in this basket. Dad! Everyone! This time they gave the girl their attention. She was pointing back the way they'd travelled. That guy with the gun is following us! Chapter 5 the balloon was already some distance away. Getting a quick fix from the sun and checking the wind by breathing in deeply and processing the various scents, Patrick set off easterly along the treeless, wind-scorched, tundra-like landscape. 
Few people knew these four hundred square miles of nothing better than he did, and if the wind held, he had a pretty good idea where they were going to come down. The heather, just starting to glow purple in the early sun, grew thickly on the downward slope, but his large bike wheels travelled over it easily. The hidden stones, hard and sharp as knives, were more of a problem. He was leaving tracks, but the grey clouds on the horizon would be here in less than an hour. The bright day was turning dark. Rain would piss right down, and his tracks, if not obliterated, would be indistinguishable from those made by farmers and park rangers. He lost sight of the balloon as he steered down through a patch of scrubland, but found it again when he came out the other side. It was much lower in the sky now. He began counting again, starting with the woman in the green jacket. Six, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, he thought. Yes, he was sure, definitely twelve. His attention in the sky, he steered too close to an outcrop of rocks. His front left wheel struck a stone, sending him lurching forwards, and he had to stop, reverse, and find his way around the rock pile. The ground here was rough, the steep hills of the Cheviots giving way to bogs and hidden rocks, and he couldn't get the bike up to its top speed. On the other hand, the wind wasn't strong, and he was gaining on them. He figured another ten minutes, fifteen at most. He shifted on the seat. One day, two hunts. He'd had worse mornings. Chapter Six No, 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 guys! You can't all look back! I need you looking where we're going! And keep still! Stop jumping around! Ignoring Nigel, the passengers pressed towards what had become the rear of the basket, facing the way they'd travelled. On the ground, far below them, a male figure riding a quad bike appeared to be following their course. I'm taking this up! Nigel burned as he spoke. Until we know for sure. He can't catch us, can he? asked the teenage boy. Another blast of flame. The balloon began to rise. Nigel said, Has anyone made contact with the ground yet? Any phone signals? Walt, any luck with that radio? I've posted a tweet, said the teenage boy. I'm not sure anyone's spotted it yet. I've only got 43 followers. His father said, My emergency call was answered, but I lost the connection. Jessica checked her phone again. Still no signal. The photograph she'd taken of the man on the ground and the dead pilot were safely stored, though. The message to Neil would go through as soon as she had a signal. He can't follow us for long, said Nigel. There'll be rivers in his way. Walls, all sorts of things. Guys, I need you to look forward, not back. I can't do it all myself. Walt, talk to me. There are woods ahead, Jessica heard her sister call out. We need to avoid those, and some electricity pylons to the south. He's gone. I can't see him any more. Jessica turned to see the bike and its rider had indeed disappeared. He's in a small valley, said the journalist. Going up and down steep slopes will slow him down. Keep trying the phones, everyone. Walter was back on his feet his face drawn and pale. Nige, there's no radio in this basket. There has to be. We heard Sean using it. I've looked everywhere. I've looked in every pocket, every bag, everywhere. It isn't here. I know where it is. Jessica turned to see tears gleaming in her sister's eyes. Sean was wearing the radio around his neck, on a strap, Isabel said. When he wasn't using it, he must have tucked it into a pocket. What are you saying? One of the men asked. You wouldn't have seen it, wouldn't have known. It, it wasn't your fault. Every other passenger was staring at her calm-faced sister in dismay. We threw it overboard. We threw it overboard when we threw Sean. I told you, wailed Natalie. I told you not to do it. No, you fucking didn't, 
yelled Walter. You told us not to put him in with you. There's no need for language like that, snapped her husband. Jesus, are you a moron? Look at us. Can you suggest when bad language might be appropriate? Frightened eyes glared across the basket. You should have some respect. Enough! Quiet! They obeyed Nigel, thank God. He was in charge now. We have no means of contacting the ground, Nigel asked. We've got phones, said Bob. Sooner or later we'll get a signal. We'll have to stay up a bit longer, that's all. I've sent another tweet, said the teenager, and my first one's been retweeted, and I might have got a text through to Gran. Thank God for the young, Jessica thought. What's happening with the guy on the quad bike? she said. Have we lost him? No, he's fallen back, but he's still following us, the journalist said. We should definitely stay up. OK, staying up seems sensible right now. Nigel was looking from one gas cylinder to the next. Trouble is, this tank's getting low, he said. We need to figure out how to switch them over. I'll have a look, Walter said. Nigel burned. The balloon rose again. As a wail of protest began, he said, We have to be quite high before I risk disconnecting the tank. And guys, keep looking round. Can anyone see a road, hm? A vehicle? Keep trying your phones. Nigel burned again. The variometer said 4,000 feet, 4,200, 4,500. The balloon speed picked up. It was noticeably colder now. I think I know how to do it, but I'd like someone else to check, said Walt. We're leaving him behind. Well, that's something. Suddenly the world darkened. A shadow had fallen over them. Above, the balloon swung sharply round, and its perfect shape began to billow and twist. This can't be good, said Martin, looking up. We've hit a squall, said Nigel. We probably should go down now. See if we can get out of it. Well, let me have a look at that. He moved to Walter's side of the balloon. You give the vent a quick pull. The two men swapped places. This, Walt said, taking hold of a thin coloured line. Nigel didn't look round. I've got it. We need to unscrew this valve and swap the pipe over. Yeah, mate, coloured cord. Give it a gentle tug. Walter pulled on the line, and the world fell away. Jessica felt a second of weightlessness akin to being in a rapidly descending lift. Her stomach lurched, and she realised the basket was falling. What's happening? Jesus, what's going on? The basket continued to fall. They were picking up speed. She was on her knees, hurtling towards the earth, her hair flying up around her head. A great weight was pushing her down, squeezing the bones of her skull. Up, up, get up! She reached out, clutching for something, anything to give her a purchase on the world, and her hands found the basket side. As though she was pulling herself out of water, she dragged herself upright. The basket was tilting as it fell the heavier passengers taking their side down faster. Over the rim she could see the grey-green-brown patterns of the earth spinning up towards her. Everyone in the basket was screaming. Maybe she was, too. Let it go! Walt, let it go! Nigel had one arm wrapped around the support wires, his feet braced against something on the basket floor. Let it go! Somehow Jessica's eyes fixed on the variometer. Four thousand feet... 3,500. The distance to the ground was melting away. Walter was slumped in the bottom of the basket, his hands empty. I have. What the hell did you pull? Nigel screamed at him. Walter, his face ashen, pointed to the thin red line. 3,000 feet. 2,500. Panic rippled across Nigel's face, as though an invisible hand had struck him. That's not it. That's not the one I've been pulling. Above their heads, the balloon had lost all shape, had collapsed in on itself, 
was almost close enough to touch. Two thousand. One thousand eight hundred. One thousand five hundred. No, no, no! Natalie, out of sight on the other side of the basket, was wailing. Use the burner! Jessica heard the words in her head, wasn't sure whether they were audible above the rushing wind and the screams. I can't reach it! Nigel, use the burner! Keeping one hand on the burner frame, Nigel reached out and released the flame. It shot up high. Ten seconds. She wasn't sure they had ten seconds. The ground was flying up to meet them now, was getting ready to swallow them whole. Nigel burned again, but the giant flame, so hot and so bright, was making no difference. The balloon was limp and dead, kept above them only by the speed of descent. Nine hundred. Five hundred and fifty. She was staring at the red line that had deflated the balloon. A short distance away was the candy-striped one that Nigel had been pulling. There are two lines, she shouted up at him. Pull the other one. Three hundred. Two hundred and fifty. We could make things worse. How can they get worse? Jessica leaned over, thought for a split second that she was going to leave the basket, took hold of the candy-striped cord and tugged. Their descent continued. Silence fell, as though people around her were too terrified to scream. She looked up. The balloon billowed and swayed, then burst into its former shape. The basket bounced once, and then seemed to hang in the air, as though giant hands had caught it. The sensation of falling had stopped. Two hundred feet. A hundred and eighty feet. A hundred and fifty feet. They were still going down, but more slowly now. Nigel burned again. A hundred and forty feet. A hundred and twenty. She started counting. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Seventy feet. Fifty feet. Fifty-five feet. Sixty feet. They'd stabilised. Someone threw up noisily. Thank God! Beads of sweat had broken out on Nigel's face. Nobody touch the red line again! He was breathing heavily as he turned to Walter. Keep burning! I'm going to switch tanks! They seemed tantalisingly close to the ground now. They could make out detail in the trees again. In the distance a cluster of buildings was visible, and the gunmetal gleam of a road... Can anyone see that bloke? Bob had climbed up onto the basket rim again. We must be in range at this height. We'll have to go up, Isabel yelled. We're going to hit a pylon, now! All heads turned. They were dangerously close to a string of electric wires, crossing the park at height. Walter fired the burner. Then a second time. The pylon was getting closer with every second. Still too many seconds before they started to rise. The balloon began to lift, slowly, sluggishly. Hold on, yelled Martin. Hold on to something. They flew past the tip of the pylon, close enough so that Jessica could have leaned out to touch it. The occupants of the balloon breathed a collective sigh of relief. Just as the bottom of the basket crashed into the wires... The bang seemed deafening. Sparks littered the air around them. The basket bounced and tipped, tossing out Natalie and her husband, as though they'd been emptied from a refuse bin. They sailed through the air, still clinging together, leaving a smell of burning in their wake. There was a sound like a siren going off as the teenage girl began to scream. The basket hit the wires again. Bob... Still perilously high on the rim, overbalanced, clutched at the air around him, then he too toppled. Fewer than ten feet below the basket, he landed on the wires. He was close enough to the pylon for the power to leap across, run through him and complete the circuit. His body started to shake and jitter, and smoke crept out of his clothes like escaping snakes. 
Screams leapt from his mouth like the bolts of electricity that were causing them. Below him, Natalie and her husband had hit the ground. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! The mother's fingers were white on her children's shoulders. Fasten your harnesses! The accountant leaned over to reach his family. All of you, clip yourselves on! Nigel tried to burn, but the flame was too small to make any real difference. Guys, we're coming down. I've got no more control. Fasten yourselves on. We're going to hit those trees! Bella, I'm clipping you on. Shit, stop moving! Jessica had been expecting the impact. She'd seen the rush of golden foliage as the trees raced towards them. Still, the force of the crash took her by surprise, sending her hurtling to the floor of the basket, banging her head hard against the solid metal of a loose harness. A second before the world slipped away, she saw her sister, whose harness she hadn't managed to fasten, thrown from the basket, her black dress trailing behind. Bella soared into the air and out of sight. Bella was flying. Chapter 7 28 Years Earlier Three children sat cross-legged on the sand, some distance from the sea, around a half-finished sandcastle. The bubble of youthful enthusiasm for the task had burst when they'd realised that without buckets or spades, Working only with hands, the shapes they could create fell a long way short of the turreted, crenellated parapets they'd seen in books. The youngest child, a mere eight years old, but still the most patient of the three, thought they could probably improve their lump of sand with decorations of shells, pebbles and seaweed. But her siblings had lost interest. Time travel, said the eldest, a boy of around fourteen. Like his sisters, he was tall for his age, with dark hair and brown eyes, heavy eyebrows and plump red lips. When he smiled, his teeth seemed large and very white. So that I can go back to the time of great crimes and stop them happening. Yeah, that would be good, said the middle child. The youngest thought that, yes, it might be good but on the other hand could cause problems that went way beyond the impact of the original crime. She was smart for an eight-year-old. Mine would be flight. The middle child thrust her arms to simulate wings, to be able to take off and soar up into the clouds, to see everything and go anywhere. The youngest child thought that sounded amazing, and also very scary. How about you, Jessie? said the boy. What would your superpower be? Jessica thought for a moment longer. It was hard sometimes, most of the time actually, keeping up with these two. I'd like to be invisible, she said. And then, because that didn't sound quite impressive enough, to have the power of invisibility. You know, to be able to turn it on and off. Not be invisible all the time. There was a moment's silence, and Jessica wondered if she'd said the wrong or even a stupid thing. Jessie, you're such a mouse. Half the time you're invisible anyway, said her brother. Don't tease her. Bella smiled at her sister. Invisibility is a great superpower. Let's go to the rock pools. Ned jumped to his feet and started running along the beach. Bella sprang up, too. What about the shoes? Jessica looked back towards the sand dunes, to the pile of shoes and socks they'd left there. They'll be fine. Bella was bouncing, eager to be off after Ned. The tide won't come this high, and who'd steal Ned's trainers? She set off at a speed Jessica knew she could never keep up with. She started trotting along behind anyway. Bella would wait for her. She always did. Chapter 8 Wednesday the 20th of September The woman he'd watched spiral out of the balloon towards the ground had landed on top of the man who'd preceded her. 
Her head was facing away from his. Her legs sprawled across his upper body. As Patrick drew closer, they looked more like puppets than people, dropped into a box that was too small. Their loose, bendable limbs had landed in strange positions and at odd angles. They weren't moving. He stopped the quad bike twenty metres away and climbed down. He left the gun on the seat, so that he wouldn't be tempted to use it, and moved towards them, keeping an eye out for loose rocks, deep puddles or the sudden appearance of a witness. Shinto got to them first and bent down, his nose close. The woman wasn't the one he was hoping to see, not the one in the green jacket who'd stared at him as though she were memorising every line and curve of his face, or as though she knew him already. He shook his head, dismissing the thought. This woman was older, in her late fifties, with dyed brown hair and grey roots. This woman was plump, her skin grey and loose on her bones. The woman in the green jacket had been slim, had looked fit. She looked as though she could run, even fight. He pushed down a wave of excitement. He could no longer see the balloon, but it couldn't have got far, not after hitting the power lines the way it had. He looked up. A man still dangled in the air above him. More than one of the wires had broken. One was dancing around, sparks flying off it. The smell reminded him of nights his family had cookouts. No need to worry about him, at least. Three down, another nine to go. If he'd been right about there being twelve people on board. He bent and searched the dead pair, finding a mobile phone in the inside pocket of the bloke. Directly beneath the twitching man on the wires, he found another phone in a conveniently bright red case. He took them both. Calling to his dog, he walked back to the bike, treading on the more solid bits of ground, or the springier patches of heather, taking care not to leave footprints. He fired it up again and set off, his mind's eye fixed on a dark-haired woman in a green jacket. He hoped she wasn't dead. Not yet. Chapter 9 Pain was everywhere, rushing through her like a blood transfusion. Jessica could hear it loud in her head, and in the cries of those around her. As the basket hit trees for a second and then a third time, she could hear the crack of skulls colliding against hard surfaces, of bones breaking, metal scraped against metal. Wires went singing into the air like crazed snakes. The wicker in front of her eyes was torn away, and the jagged branch of a tree stabbed in towards her. It missed her by inches. The basket hit the ground hard and bounced back up. It did the same thing again. Each impact felt as though she were being thrown against a stone wall. She could no longer see Nigel at the controls. They were completely pilotless now. She'd fallen into the bottom of the basket. She was staring directly up at the balloon, but its beautiful sphere had twisted into something misshapen and ugly. It seemed to leer down towards her, and she cringed away instinctively. She tried to curl up, to keep her limbs close to her body, but she was being thrown about so much. Only the harness that she was clinging to kept her within the confines of the basket, and yet her shoulder muscles felt stretched and torn with the effort. The jarring and banging stopped as they were swooped up one more time. She had a moment of wondering if she were alone in the basket, the only one not to have been thrown overboard, but then the screaming made its way into her head. There were others, still clinging to this flimsy piece of wicker work, clinging and screaming. She had no idea where her sister was. The basket flew into something and tipped. She fell against its side, the jagged edge of the torn wicker scraping her face. A scream burst nearby and faded as it fell towards the ground. Then the basket seemed to settle. Bella! There was an answering cry. 
It didn't sound like her sister, but she couldn't be sure. Bella, I can't see you! The balloon soared up into the sky again. Then for a split second, the basket was surrounded by the purest, clearest blue. Chapter 10 22 Years Earlier Jessica had never seen sky such a consistent shade of blue before. A blue that was pure, clear and rich, too soft to be sapphire, too deep to be cornflower. There was simply no other shade to which it could be compared. It was the colour of forever, of timelessness, a colour one could lose oneself in. She knew that for her, it would always be the colour of sadness. The ocean was blue too, and calmer than Jessica had ever seen it. When a gull flew low, following the line of the sand, its streamlined white shape, was reflected perfectly in the water. Her sister was a metre or two ahead. Jessica had dropped back when she'd started to cry. I don't get it, Bella, she called out. Isabel stopped walking, but didn't turn, and she didn't plant her weight evenly on both feet. She was pausing, not stopping. This wasn't going to be a conversation, merely a repetition of the point she'd already made. I don't expect you to understand, Jess. Not yet. Jessica had run out of arguments. All she could do now was cry and complain like a child. First Mum, then Ned, then Dad. Now you. I'm losing everyone. In her head, she stamped her foot on the sand. Her misery was becoming rage. Also, she was afraid. Fourteen years old, but still with a child's natural fear of abandonment. Bella turned then, stepped back and put her arms around Jessica. She was still taller. All these years Jessica had been waiting to catch up. Now she was wondering if she ever would. You'll be fine, Jess. Auntie Brenda and Uncle Rob love you. They'll take very good care of you. In four more years you'll go to university. You'll do brilliantly and make me so proud. And then you'll get married and you'll have children. You'll be happy. And this sadness will be something that was with you once but past. Well, what about Ned? Why can't he come home so we can live together? You, me and Ned. Bella stiffened in her sister's arms. That can't happen, Jess. You mustn't ask me that again. Why? What has he done? Why did he have to go away? Where has he even gone? Bella began pulling away. Jessica held on, but Bella was stronger. She always had been. She pulled out of her sister's reach. I'll tell you more in time, Jess, she said, when you're older. For now, you just have to accept that this is how it has to be. Everyone is leaving me. Jess, I can't live with you right now, but I will never leave you. I promise you, never. Chapter 11 Wednesday the 20th of September The other passengers were dead. They had to be. She could sense a great silence closing in, creeping into her mouth and spreading downwards, like dark slime, filling every hollow in her body. It wasn't so bad, actually. Just a quiet slipping away. The explosion flung her through the air. There was a burning heat on her face, then tiny wounds jabbed at her on all sides. She thought of the fires of hell, and of a thousand little devils prodding her with pitchforks. She felt heavy. There was a crippling pain in her body as though she were being hung from a great height. Then, nothing. Chapter 12 
21 years earlier. Candles flickered as people started to move. The service was drawing to a close. Several women had handkerchiefs to their faces. Jessica had heard sniffing throughout, even the occasional sob. Lovely service, said someone behind. In her new red coat and hat, Jessica felt as cold and unmoved as the stone pillars. To the glorious crescendo of organ music, the procession made its way down the aisle. It seemed to Jessica as though all eyes were on her sister. The lace of her long white dress gleamed in the candlelight, and her face could have been carved from marble. Her new wedding ring shone on her left hand. Bella had never looked more beautiful. She seemed to smile at something in the distance as heads turned to watch the lovely girl in her bridal gown glide down the aisle and out of the chapel doors. Jessica felt a hand on her shoulder. Come on, love, said Aunt Brenda, who had also brought a new coat and hat for the occasion. The congregation was leaving too, following the procession. Jessica, who had been sitting on one of the aisle seats, picked up her bag and joined them. Her aunt and uncle followed behind. In the lobby of the chapel, out on the steps, spilling down into the garden, people gathered, chattering somberly, congratulating each other, pretending to be happy. Nobody here was happy. It was a ridiculous farce and that her clever, strong, wise sister should be a part of it. Jessica edged her way through the crowd and out of the main door. There were six steps, and she ran down them. She'd seen peacocks in the grounds, and although she'd always been slightly afraid of them, she thought she might hunt them down now. Maybe she'd wring one of their necks. Jess! She turned. Bella was at the top of the steps. Lifting the lace of her gown with one hand, she made her way carefully down towards her sister. She looked so beautiful, and so very, very sad. You look pathetic, Jessica said. It's a travesty. Worse, it's disgusting. Bella sighed. This is something I need to do. You have to accept that. You have your own life to lead. Why can't you let me lead mine? Jessica stepped closer, so that she could hiss in her sister's face. Because this isn't you. Look at you, all decked up like a bride in a cheap second-hand nylon dress. Where's your groom, Isabel? A married woman with no man is a joke. I'm sorry you feel that way. I have to go now. I have to change. The gravel crunched as Isabel stepped away. She looked impossibly slim in the tight bodice, her long skirts trailing behind her. Jessica knew it would be the last time she saw her sister looking this way. When she and the others came back down from their rooms and rejoined the congregation in chapel, they would all be shrouded in black. You'll not stay here! Jessica shouted. I don't know what you're running from, and I don't care what you're afraid of. But this is monstrous. Isabel didn't turn. Do you hear me, Bella? You will never be a nun. People on the steps, other postulants who just formalised their vows, their families, several of the black-clad sisters of the Carmelite order, were watching the two of them. Jessica turned and walked away from the priory. She hadn't known it was possible to hurt this much. Chapter 13 Wednesday the 20th of September Where was she? Where was this place of darkness and pain? She hadn't known it was possible to hurt so much. It was tearing her apart from the inside and crushing her into dust. Her body was broken. There was no way out of this agony. It was consuming her whole. She wasn't breathing. 
She was panting, gasping for breath. She lay, bewildered, frightened, unable to move. She had a sense, too, that she'd been hurting for a long time, slipping in and out of consciousness. The air around her was crackling and rustling, like the inside of a faulty radio. Radio. Walter was looking for a radio. But Walt had leapt out of the basket after the second time it hit the trees. He'd thrown himself over the side and disappeared. What on earth had happened to her? She remembered driving through the dark, pre-dawn, being surrounded by pale, excited faces. Nigel, brave, clever Nigel, yelling at them to fasten themselves in, even as they fell, at impossible speed through the last bit of sky. The balloon. They'd crashed. She opened her mouth. Nothing came out. So she tried her eyes, and they at least still worked. After a few seconds of blinking away tears, she was able to focus. She was in a tree, surrounded by dry yellow leaves. Sharp twigs pressed into her. There was something hard in the small of her back and something else digging into her neck. As she lay there, staring up into the tangle of branches and foliage, she became aware that the pain surrounding her was changing, focusing. She was able to say now which parts of her hurt and which didn't. Most did. Also that she was lying on her side, one leg caught higher in the tree, the other hanging loose. A loud flapping sound just out of view and she turned her head, even though her neck felt as if it could barely hold it up. The balloon. It was close less than three metres away, hanging empty and spent from the tree branches. It jumped and stretched in the wind, desperate to be free again, to fly one last time, but the branches held it tight. Then she was distracted again, by a voice from directly below. Help! Help! Can anyone hear me? Someone else was alive. She began feeling around, knowing she was some way off the ground, dreading the cracking sound that would be the branch beneath her breaking. Her arms, at least, did what she told them to. She could move her head. Looking up, she could see a vertical trail of broken branches. Also, several feet above her head, too high to reach and almost invisible amongst the yellow leaves, was the turquoise case of a mobile phone. There was something very, very important about that phone. Chapter 14 Patrick drove the quad bike up the last rise and smiled. The balloon was draped around a tree like a clumsily wrapped Christmas parcel, its basket hanging lopsided just a few feet from the ground. He freed one hand to pull out his phone. Hmm. Still no signal. But it told him that nearly thirty minutes had passed since the balloon had flown over the old house. If the pilot had been in radio contact with his ground crew, they might not be far away. He had very little time. Bouncing over the moor, he almost missed the man lying face down in the heather. At its highest before the winter frost struck, the vegetation hid much of his body, and had it not been for the bright-coloured anorak, he would have driven straight past him. He cut the bike's engine, again some distance away, and ran over. He was trying not to give in to a sense of panic, but the ground crews always followed hot on the trail of these balloons. This guy had leapt out. He couldn't be this distance away otherwise. His right leg was broken, bent at an angle. He put a horse down with an injury that bad, no question. Not to mention a dog. He was still alive. From several feet away it was possible to see the rapid panting, hear the breath hissing in and out through damaged lungs. Blood had gathered in his mouth and slipped out onto the heather. Patrick stood above the injured man for a second, having no sense of whether or not the guy knew he was there. Then he dropped down heavily 
kneeling on the man's back, driving his face into the ground. He grasped his head, took a deep breath, and then pulled up and round. The neck broke with a satisfying snap. He had to reach in three pockets before he found the guy's mobile phone. He slipped it into his own pocket, along with the one he'd taken from the dead couple, and the one he'd found beneath the man hanging from the electricity wires. That was four passengers taken care of. Another eight to go. A mother and two teenage kids, he thought. A few more blokes. And the woman in the green jacket. He was saving her till last. He got back on the bike and drove closer to the balloon. There'd been an explosion of some sort. Only a small one, there were no flames left. But he could see where part of the wicker was charred and black. Thin spirals of smoke reached up towards the branches of the tree. On foot again, he approached carefully. If people were still alive and able to fight back, they were more likely to be in the basket. He heard someone shouting when he was several metres away. Is someone there? Help! So much for being quiet. She must have heard the bike. My son's badly injured, and I think my leg is broken. I've no idea where my husband and daughter are. Can you help, please? Yes, he could help. He had a pretty good idea where her husband was. There was a body five feet from the basket, lying sprawled over a crop of jagged rocks. Five down. This guy had taken the brunt of the explosion. He moved in closer and looked down at the red and scorched skin of the dead man. Your husband lost his face, he called. He stinks like burned meat. And one of his ribs seems to be sticking out through his shirt. A moment of silence then. Who are you? Don't worry. I'm here to help. I'll make it all better. The woman didn't reply. He stepped towards the basket and heard her whimper. Hi. He peered over the rim. She looked up before reaching across the basket, as though to shield her son who was by her side. Her twisted legs didn't move. My son's only fifteen, she said. Please, don't hurt us. Her son was dead. His skin was already turning a sickly pale white. Give me his phone. She stared dumbly back at him. I don't know where it is. He grabbed her hair and pulled her upwards, hearing the sickening crunch of broken bones rubbing together. She let out a strangled cry. He turned round saw a rock the right size, and bent to pick it up. She was tougher than she looked. It took three good strikes to finish her off. Seven down. Five remaining. A bloke who'd obviously fancied himself as a pilot was still strapped into a harness in the centre of the basket. His head had been sliced nearly clean from his body by the metal frame that had once held the burners in place. Blood was still pumping out, but feebly. He too had taken some of the explosion's blast. Four still missing. One of them a teenage girl. And the woman in green. Keeping an eye on the horizon, his ears alert, he walked round to check the other basket compartments. Just one man huddled down in the corner of the balloon. Blood surrounded him. As he drew closer, he saw the white gleam of bone sticking out of the man's neck, found a phone in a top jacket pocket. It was all going well. But he was probably running out of time. He caught sight of dark brown hair just as he was thinking he was going to have to leave it at that, trust to luck that no one else had survived. A woman, 
was lying at the base of a large beech tree. He stood perfectly still, watching, savouring the moment. He really didn't want her to be dead. Then he heard something, a rustling sound, coming from directly above. Chapter 15 Clinging to the tree trunk, breathing in its damp sawdust smell, terrified of missing her footing, she inched herself down until she could make out the moorland grass and a corner of the tilted basket through a lattice work of branches. Below, a quad bike was drawing close. It seemed to be directly beneath her when the engine stopped. The excited barking of a dog rang out and the woman below called again. Hello, can you help me, please? A dark shadow moved across the ground. A man came into view, and terror grabbed her by the throat. No, no, this man was not here to help. She had no idea how she knew this, she just knew. Closing her eyes tight, she heard the crash of a rock, slamming down again and again on a human skull and the strangled, inhuman cries that left the dying woman's mouth. Then silence. Only for a second. His shadow approached the trunk. His feet crunched over the scattering of beech nuts at its base. She drew back her head, a second before he looked up. She could hear his breathing, feel his eyes roving through the leaves and branches. Anyone up there? he called. Pressing her face into the bark, she closed her eyes. The temptation to speak, to end the torturous suspense, almost overwhelming. A rush of wind tore through the tree. She heard it shake the surrounding leaves, lift the ripped silk of the balloon, as though the wind were on his side, trying to pull her from the tree, lift the covering of balloon fabric and expose her. Hello? He called again. He was toying with her. He could see her. He could almost reach her if he stood on tiptoe. She waited, panting, for the feel of his hand gripping her ankle. This is the police, he said. An ambulance is on its way. Anyone up there need help? He was not the police. The wind ran cold fingers through the branches, as though the man had sent his dark thoughts into the tree to search her out. She had a sense of small, evil creatures, scurrying along, lifting foliage, searching out her scent. Then she heard the twist of dried grass as he turned and left the shade of the tree. Still playing with her, he wanted to lure her out. Or maybe... She held on tight, and let her weight slide lower until she found another branch. Dangerously exposed now, she could see the man walking away. She knew this man. Images flashed through her head, of him raising a gun, bringing a rock down on a young woman's head, chasing them. His hair was long, curling beneath his hat to the nape of his neck. He was broad in the shoulder, strong in the legs. He was heading for a figure on the ground, a figure she recognised instantly. She saw him stop when he was close enough. He nudged her sister's body with his foot. Why was her sister lying over there, not moving? She had to do something. Her body wouldn't obey her. Terror held her frozen. He seemed to spend a long time looking down. She let out the breath and drew another, then another. She watched him kneel, lean forward, and he seemed to be smelling her sister's hair. He moved his head backwards and forwards, like an animal nuzzling for food. She saw the rise of his shoulders as he inhaled. Finally, he pulled a mobile phone out of his pocket and stared at the screen. He made a gesture with his other hand, a clenching of the fist, then began punching at the keyboard. 
As he did so, he jumped up and strode back to his bike. He fired the engine, turned it around and drove away, the phone pressed to his face. The dog followed behind. When she could no longer see the bike, she dropped to the ground, one thought clear in her bemused, befuddled brain. He hadn't killed her sister. He hadn't even tried. That meant she was already dead. Chapter 16 It was shortly after nine o'clock when Patrick got back to the ruins of the Harcourt Manor. His mother's steel-grey Land Rover Defender was parked at the front, next to his brother's Mercedes. As he cut the engine, he realised he was holding his breath. His two older brothers climbed down out of the car and leaned against its side. The stout woman with the bright red hair struggled down from the Defender, her Wellingtons making deep imprints in the mud. Her skirt was tight around her broad hips, and it had ridden up in the car, exposing fat legs in thick black tights. She wore a silver quilted jacket with gold zips, and giant hooped earrings bounced against her sagging jawline. She walked over, cigarette clamped between her teeth. When she was close enough to swing for him, she did exactly that. A short, hard slap across his left cheek nearly knocked his nose off his face. Get off, Mar! At least he was breathing again. Waiting for it was always the worst. How can you not hear a fucking hot air balloon? Where is she? He pointed back through the house, towards the garden. His mother marched ahead, her Wellington squelching with every step. His brothers followed. He brought up the rear, as Shinto leapt into his mother's vehicle and settled down on the back seat. The girl was where he'd left her. His mother strode up, squatted down and put her plump fingers on the girl's neck. Her other hand went to the rosary around her own neck. Is she alive? asked William. Uh, just. She straightened up. His brothers bent down and lifted the girl's unconscious body. The four of them set off back towards the front of the house. Talk to me, idiot, his ma said. I shot the man on the burner thing, Patrick said. The rest of them died when the balloon crashed. He kept his gaze down and out of the corner of his eye, saw his mother cross herself, the gold crucifix on the end of her rosary clutched in her right hand. God bless us and save us, she muttered. He threw him out of the balloon, he said. I know where he is. We find him, hide the body, and no one will ever know it wasn't a bad accident. Do you think they didn't have phones with them, you numbskull? They'll have been taking pictures, sending messages. There's no signal here, and I picked up all the phones I could find. He pulled open his coat pocket to reveal the collection of mobile phones that had been weighing him down all the way back. He'd found eight. Well, that in itself will make them curious. Umpteen people in a balloon and none of them had their phones with them. Loads of stuff on Twitter, said Charles, as William held open the rear door of the Mercedes and the girl was pushed inside. But just retweets and comments. Nothing from the balloon itself apart from that first couple. And they didn't mention you. We'll be bloody lucky if no one sent a text. If no one took your photo. And how do you know you found them all? I counted them, didn't I? When I was following it. Twelve passengers. I found ten. All dead. You found ten? I ran out of time. Don't worry, Ma. They have to be dead. We need to find the pilot, Charles said. I know, their mother said. Before the whole... Fucking more is swarming with filth. Jesus love us. We do not need this. Not this week. Chapter 17 Twelve Years Earlier Two women, 
one wearing an oversized green sweater, the other in the flowing black robes of a Carmelite nun, kicked their way through a shallow drift of leaves. Autumn had come late to Northumberland. The Indian summer had lasted well into October, and only towards the end of the month had the leaves started to turn and fall. Now, the first week in November, the weather was unseasonably mild, with apples still clinging to branches in the priory's orchard. Bella, said Jessica as she held up the willow basket. Hmm? Her sister replied. The apple she was stretching for fell into her hand and went into the basket. Whenever I have something I need to work out, some problem I'm grappling with, do you know how I do it? Isabel walked around the tree to reach the other side. I have a feeling you want to tell me. Pass me the step, will you? Jessica positioned the small plastic step against the trunk, checking it was stable before stepping back and letting her sister use it. I have an imaginary conversation with you in my head, she said. I put my arguments to you and you respond. Isabel, a good head higher on the step, thought about this for a second. Do I give good advice? she asked. Mainly you tell me what I want to hear. Doesn't sound much like me. With three apples in her hands, Isabel jumped down. I like your sweater. Is it new? Yes, it's from Hobbs. How do you do it? Isabel set off towards the next tree. Sorry? How do you work on problems? Do you have imaginary conversations with me? Or with Hildegard? Or with... I don't know, with... God? Suggested Isabel. What colour would you call it? Green, said Jessica. Do you? If I'd known how interrogative taking your detective exams would make you, I'm not sure I'd have suggested it. I'm serious, Bella. Isabel was silent for a while. Then, I have very few problems that merit that amount of effort, she said. And green doesn't do it justice. That sweater's the colour of a shamrock. Or an emerald. I try it on, but... She nodded towards the other side of the orchard, to where several of the nuns were working in the vegetable garden. You know. Jessica could feel her stomach tightening. Isabel always did this. She would listen patiently for hours, while Jessica talked about her own life, but ask her a question about her own. When I'm doing well, she tried again, when I'm doing something impressive at work, or when I won that commendation last year, I always imagine you watching me on a hidden CCTV camera, silently cheering me on. Which I am, of course, always, even if there is no hidden CCTV. What's this about, Jess? I'm nothing to you, am I? Her sister stopped dead. If the look on her face could be trusted, she was genuinely shocked. Jess? Jessica gestured that they should carry on fruit picking. Oh, I know you love me, of course you do, but I make no difference to your life. You'd get on perfectly well, with or without me. Isabel's voice was low and thoughtful when she spoke again, finally taking her younger sister seriously. That's completely untrue. I don't blame you, really I don't. We both made our choices, but I can't help thinking about the difference. If you lost me, you'd cope fine. Whereas if I lost you, oh, I think it would be the end of me. Chapter 18 Wednesday the 20th of September her sister's body was feet away. Impossible to mistake that wide-eyed stare, that lifeless pallor. The person she loved most in the world had been taken. 
Was this, then, the end of her? Chapter 19 When the pilot's body had fallen to the ground, Patrick had made a point of fixing the location in his mind. Gently rising land, narrow stream to the southwest, a small copse of evergreen trees to the north. Even so, it took the better part of an hour to find it again. The pilot had landed on scrubland. Giant spires of cow parsley and burdock reached higher than any man fighting his way through them. Nettles spread across the ground, and the thick stems of ground elder clutched at his bike's wheels. As he approached the spot, he could hear his mother's Land Rover close behind, then his brother's Mercedes. He thought for a second, then veered left. The ground was softer here, and getting stuck could be the last straw for his short-tempered mother. He steered around a cluster of stones and saw him. The high-visibility waterproof jacket, gleaming white, blue and yellow on the hillside, made it easy. The pilot was lying face up, or would have been if he'd had any face left. He drove over and cut his engine. Behind him, his mother and brother did the same. Mary crossed herself as she approached the body. Charles and William copied her instantly. After a moment, he did too. Sometimes it was easier to go along with it. They stared down at the headless corpse. Bless us, his own mother wouldn't know him, Mary said. Police will know him, said Charles. Fingerprints, dental records, DNA. Chop his fingers off? suggested William. Don't be a fucking fool. They'll still know it's him. We have to get rid of him. Pat, check his pockets. Patrick did as he was told, finding the pilot's phone and wallet in one inside pocket. His name had been Sean Allen. William, his shaved head pink and sore from a summer of sunburn, was looking down at the dead man with an expression like someone had pissed on his shoes. What I don't get like is... Where's his fucking head? Patrick didn't have to turn round to know the look on his mother's face. She loved all her sons, but as she often said, some made it easier than others. I shot it, he said, moving on to the outside pockets of the pilot's coat. Yeah, but it should still be somewhere. That's bone and blood and... Oh, what are brains made out of? Brains, said Charles. Yeah, but what I'm saying is they don't just vanish because they've been shot. Even a stopped clock is right twice a day, muttered Mary. There'll be traces of this man in the balloon. The police will find them, even if they never find this. She nudged the pilot with her foot. They'll know something went down. Maybe. Patrick continued, looking through pockets. There were a lot of them. But they won't know what. And by the time they're sure there's something to investigate, there won't be anything left to see. And I'm a lucky man. He held up what he'd found. The balloon's radio. They couldn't call for help, he said. The daft twats threw the radio overboard. And there's no phone signal here. Couldn't tell anyone what happened. Charles, who had the sharpest ears, had stepped away from the group. Can anyone else hear that? They listened for a second. Helicopter, said Mary. Fuck's sake, get him in the car. She strode back to the defender and pulled open the rear doors. Her son scooped up the body and carried him over. They bundled him into the rear of the vehicle, threw a ground sheet over him and closed the doors. Home? Mary said. I'll see you there, Patrick said. Got something to do. Chapter 20 She had no idea how long she'd been sitting beside her sister's body. She wasn't even sure she'd been conscious for all of it. 
All she knew was that the pain in her head was sending waves of nausea through her, that her clothes were cold and clinging, and that her legs didn't feel as though they'd ever be able to unfold and get her back to her feet. The sky overhead was darker now. On the horizon she could see grey streaks running in sharp diagonal lines from the heavens to the ground. That was a very heavy storm coming. The woodland they'd crashed into was on one of the lower crests of the park, and she could see for some distance in every direction except through the trees. There were no buildings, no roads. The only sign that others still shared the planet were the power lines. There were dead people everywhere. The mother and son, the father a little distance from the basket, the journalist, the hiker in the red coat, so many dead people. Maybe she was one of them. Maybe all around her were ghosts of these other people, just sitting and wondering what on earth had happened. Somewhere out of sight a dog began barking. Then, through the sound of the approaching storm, she heard the engine of a quad bike. Distant but getting louder. Heading this way. Panic coursed like red-hot liquid through her body once more. He was coming back. Chapter 21 Ajax! E over here, Ajax lad! Superintendent Ajax Maldonado stopped in his tracks, sighed and turned 180 degrees. The tiny, deeply wrinkled West Indian woman was heading towards him across the reception area, at a speed that shouldn't have been possible given her age, her size, and the zimmer frame she tossed out in front of her before every step. Teresa, how did you get here? She lived miles away, and as far as he knew, she'd never owned a car. Number seventeen, she told him. Them buggers have been at it again. Swear words on my back fence. Red paint this time. Teresa, why didn't you go to Clifford Street like I told you? Or phone? This is headquarters. We don't deal with... He'd been about to say minor complaints, but that was not a phrase you used with Teresa when she was off on one. She pulled her face. Them idiots. They don't know their backsides from their elbows, pardon my Jamaican. I told them I know the boss. I told them... You went to school with my clock, and they said they never heard of you, that the new boss was some fella called Jones, Chief Constable John Jones. Why you tell me you're the boss? There was no point asking her to lower her voice. It would only make her worse. I never said I was the boss, Teresa. She stepped right up close. It would hurt her neck to look up at him for long but she didn't seem to care. She brushed a few drops of rain off his coat. Any second now, she'd have her hanky out, be spitting on it, rubbing a smudge off his nose. How many buttons and barbels does that Jones fella have, then? She said. More than me. He lifted her zimmer and turned her gently back towards reception. Now I'm going to have someone drive you home. A nice young lady, how about that? Nice young man, she told him, her lips pressing tight together. And I'm going to come round to see you this evening. She darted a sideways glance. What time? We'll have a cup of tea and I'll try to get that paint off. Oh, you'll do that. Her round, wrinkled face lit up. Tonight? Yeah. I don't have much on, he said, hoping he hadn't jinxed the entire day. But only if you promise me that you won't come here again. Why? She raised her voice again. You worried they'll think I'm your mum. She threw back her head and cackled like the witch of Endor. Ah, oh, lad, you'd be a lot better looking if you were my boy. Five minutes later. After waving Teresa out of the building, 
Ajax reached the second floor. Morning, sir. Stacy, who he swore bribed the reception staff to let her know when he arrived every morning, was waiting at the top of the stairs. I wanted to catch you before you get stuck into something. I'm all yours, Stace. He walked down the corridor, past the glass-fronted offices, towards his own room at the far end. Sir? The door to the main office opened, and a constable in shirt sleeves leaned out. Two minutes, chappers, Ajax told him. Stacey has the comms. He carried on, conscious that DC Steve Chapman was following him as well now. The bottom line from Cheltenham, said Stacey, hurrying to keep pace. I was on to them first thing, is that the email they've intercepted came from a server with no history of interacting with any known persons of interest and is probably not to be taken seriously. Hooks? Ajax pushed open his door and spun his hat towards the coat stand. It missed. Stacy bent to pick it up. On the other hand, given a match of this prominence, given Britain's recent engagement in the Middle East, just the existence of the threat bumps the match up to Category C+. Plus. Sir? D.C. Chapman was hovering in the doorway. This really... Ajax held up a finger. The following evening, Newcastle were playing AC Milan in a friendly at St James's Park, and GCHQ had picked up traffic about a possible terrorist incident. It wasn't considered high priority, but the constabulary was to be on maximum alert all the same. A hot air balloon crashed in the National Park! Chapman almost shouted at him. Thirteen people on board! All believed dead! Ajax gave the news the second of silence it seemed to demand, then dropped his head into his hands. When he looked up, it was to see a small crowd gathering in the doorway. For an instant he let his eyes rest on the one photograph on his desk. A young woman with a wide grin and dark curly hair. OK, people. He raised his head. Room 201 becomes the incident room. We need an op name and as many free lines as we've got diverting to it. Chappers, get on the phone to Alan in IT. It's Operation Wildfire, sir. I already checked. And the lines are in hand. Good lad. I want you, Stacy, Bex and George to make your way to 201. I need all the computers switched on, the whiteboards clearing and maps of the National Park. Stacy, you're in charge of initial comms. As soon as we have a statement, get it on the homepage, along with an emergency phone number. We'll need a press statement ASAP. See if you can draft something for me. George was holding up a phone. Owner of the balloon company, he told his boss. Richard Allen. Ajax unmuted the handset. Richard, I'm on my way out to you. Stay in the office, please, and buy the phone. I'll be there within the hour. Chapter 22 A second before Ajax released the handbrake, Mojo joined him. Her perfume filled the car, making him think of pine forests and sweet wood smoke. He smiled, and the grip on his chest relaxed a fraction. Good morning. He paused just for a second, just to look at her. She smiled back, said, I was first with my hand up. Northumberland Constabulary Emergency Protocols dictated that a senior officer attended each major or potentially major incident, until an appropriate line of command could be established. It also recommended that the senior officer take an experienced detective constable to assist. Ajax and Mojo had worked together many times. You up to speed? he asked her, raising his voice above the clatter of the rain on the car roof. The outside world was barely visible beyond the grey streaks. The northern edge of the National Park was about sixty miles distant. He had to hope the weather was better there. Not really, 
The balloon company is based in Kelso, he told her. The balloon itself took off from a site about ten miles southwest of there, shortly before six this morning. It was expected to come down up to an hour later somewhere in the National Park. It didn't. But that's not so very unusual, apparently. They often drift slightly off course, so no one at the company was worried at first. Mojo looked at her watch, although she probably knew it was going up for ten o'clock. Good police officers were always aware of the time. Experienced pilot? she asked. According to the company's owner, one of the best. But he would say that. He's the guy's dad. Ouch. Shortly before nine, Northern Area took a call from a local farmer. Ajax continued. He'd seen the balloon flying very low over his land and wasn't happy. Scares his sheep or something. So he gave chase on his quad bike, meaning to give the pilot what for, and after quite a bit of driving around, he found it hanging from some trees, believed to be multiple casualties. OK, let's panic check. Incident room set up? Ajax pulled out onto the main road. Done. He put his foot down to catch the lights. Already puddles were forming at the side of the road. Uniform on site? Three patrol cars. One ambulance with a couple of paramedics is on its way, and I've requested air ambulance. And three appliances from fire and rescue. Hospital and morgue informed? She dropped her head forward to fluff the rainwater out of her long, dark hair. It was currently tinted purple, not his favourite. Berwick Infirmary and Borders General are on standby. I've also let Newcastle General know. We're talking a maximum body count of thirteen. Park authorities notified? Mojo folded down the passenger mirror and leaned towards it. Done. They're putting out a call to their search teams. I've also requested assistance from the dogs unit. It'll take them at least an hour to mobilise. And why don't you get ready in the station toilets like all the other girls? The car phone was ringing. Mojo pulled a face when she saw who was calling. She and Stacy had never seen eye to eye. Go ahead, Stacy, he said. Sir, it's on Twitter. Low-key at the moment, but you know how these things can go viral. From what we can gather, one of the passengers tweeted while they were still in the air, and it's been retweeted a few times. What? said Ajax. What did it say? Er, uh, hold on. Uh, got it. A uh, hot air balloon out of control over Northumberland National Park. Red, yellow, blue spiral. Please call 999. Hashtag SOS. Hashtag help. The National Park picked up on it and started asking their staff and visitors to look out for a stray hot air balloon. Any minute now, they're going to catch on that it's crashed. You might have a crowd to deal with when you get there. Oh, and um, we're getting quite a few people phoning in. Relatives or journalists? Journos for now, and we can put them off, but it won't be long. He'd no sooner disconnected Stacy. Then another call came in. We've had final numbers from Milan, Ajax. They've sold 10,000 tickets, expecting another 2,000 to travel on spec. 50 officers, best they can do. Great. Do me a favour, Gaz. Let the boss know we will need to deploy the full 200 of ours and keep our fingers crossed nothing else happens tomorrow night, because the good citizens of Northumbria will be on their own. Another call. Stacy again. Sir, we have a passenger list, she said. Thirteen people, including the pilot, as we thought. Any kids on board? he asked, with a sideways glance at Mojo. The company don't take anyone up under the age of fourteen, Stacy told him. But there were a couple of older teenagers, Nathan and Poppy Colton, with their parents, Harry and Helen. Mm, bad enough. Anyone else I need to know about? Um, a few hikers, middle-aged couple, bloke on his own. Oh, and there was a nun, Stacy said. Sister Maria Magdalena. She went up with her sister, her 40th birthday present, apparently. 
For the nun, not the sister. I can see it. Mojo leaned forward in her seat, wiping condensation off the passenger window. Ten minutes earlier, they'd left the road behind and followed open moorland to the GPS reference of the crash site. As he turned the car, Ajax too could see the balloon, collapsed over trees, its bright colours incongruous in the autumn rainstorm. A little further and he could see the emergency vehicles, several police land rovers, an ambulance, lots of people milling around, several of them civilians, police tape and a wide circle around the copse of trees, the basket burned and torn. He pulled up a few metres short of the tape, and he and Mojo climbed down. A uniformed officer came to meet them. This isn't good, sir, the constable said as they all walked back towards the tape. Nor survivors that we've found. Twenty metres in front of the trees sat a man on a quad bike, wearing heavy-duty clothes and a tweed cap. Two collie dogs huddled, shivering at his side. Chuff Reynolds, the constable told Ajax. Local farmer. He came across the crash. Seems to be in shock. Probably needs medical attention, but not a priority right now. Ajax strode ahead as uniformed officers continued to hammer stakes into the ground and unroll extra police tape to erect tents over bodies. He saw the first of them when he was still thirty metres away. A bloke wearing a blue oilskin jacket, face down. He crouched beside him, put a finger to his neck. The skin was cold and damp, already turning the colour of church candles. No pulse that he could feel. He lifted the jacket and pulled a wallet out of the pocket. Superintendent Maldonado? Ajax got to his feet to see a man wearing the logo of the balloon company on his jacket. His face was the colour of ash, and his jaw set tight. I'm Richard Allen, he said. Uh, we spoke on the phone. I, I own the company. Any idea what happened here, Mr. Allen? Allen stared at the garishly clothed tree and let his eyes drop. It didn't come down naturally, that's for sure. Not with this amount of mayhem. You mean a crash landing? Alan shook his head. A oh, crash landing wouldn't be this bad. People would have survived a crash landing. That thing plummeted. They took a few steps closer. Alan seemed to be hanging back. Only thing I can think of is that someone accidentally pulled the RDL. Alan said. The what? A rapid deceleration line. It's a red cord in the pilot's compartment. It's meant to empty the envelope quickly once the basket's on the ground. If you pull it at altitude, the envelope collapses completely and the whole thing goes down like a brick. Why on earth would anyone do that? Well, the pilot wouldn't, Alan said. Someone with a death wish might have leaned across and done it. But Sean would simply have pulled another line, a candy strike one that would reinflate the balloon. Even if the red cord was pulled, if Sean was on board, he could have rescued the situation. They were very close to the basket now. But I think something else has gone on here. See these scorch marks? He indicated blackened lines on the wicker. This looks to me like the basket hit a power line at some point, and one of the tanks exploded. They turned and fixed on the distant pylons. Something about them didn't look quite right. I'll have someone drive over there, said Ajax. I'm going to check the basket now. You might want to stay here. Ajax stepped forward. He'd been first on the scene to many disasters. It never got easier. He could feel Mojo's breathing on the back of his neck, felt her hand brush briefly against his. Thirteen people in this balloon, he muttered. I'll come up and only see one of them. 
Most of them would have been harnessed, she replied. They'll still be in the basket. It isn't going to be pretty in there, A.J. He stopped just shy of the basket and peered over the brim. Two bodies directly beneath him. The teenage boy whose name he couldn't remember, and a woman who was probably his mother. The pilot was still in his compartment, still in his harness. His head was practically hanging off. If the pilot was still in position, what the hell had gone wrong here? That isn't Sean, said a voice behind him. Without being heard, Alan had followed him. Ajax looked from the dead pilot to the man he'd understood was his father. Are you sure? Six two, fifteen stone. And he had red hair. This'll be one of the passengers. But what he's doing in the pilot's compartment in the pilot's harness is beyond me. There was one more passenger, also dead, in the basket. A middle-aged, portly man. Where are the others? Mojo asked. Alan looked up into the tree. So did Ajax. There's something up there. I see it, Alan said. Not a body, though. A piece of cloth. Lots of broken branches. I'd say someone fell through the tree. They stepped away from the basket to see that CSIs were climbing the rise towards them. That's five people accounted for, Ajax said. He had still to find. A uniform was waiting to talk to him. Sir, there's another body. Twenty metres in that direction. The woman on the ground looked asleep, not dead. She lay on her back, her eyes closed, arms at her sides. Her body barely seemed broken at all, until you got very close and saw the line of her neck didn't quite run true. Her black dress was torn and filthy, but the cross around her neck lay perfectly between her small breasts. Her hair would perhaps have reached her chin if she'd been upright. It was very curly, with a few strands of silver breaking up its deep brown. There was no sign of her veil. Sister Maria Magdalena, said Mojo. She was so pretty. Ajax walked up to the dead nun and stood looking down. One side of her face was perfect, a high cheekbone, a half moon of dark eyelashes below an arched brow, a full, plump mouth. The other side was barely recognisable as a face. Sister Maria had been caught in the explosion. Six dead, he said. It's not looking good, is it? Nine, said the constable. We've found another three. Chapter 23 Fifteen minutes later, Ajax felt his neck aching from looking up at the charred body on the power lines. We need to get that poor bastard down from there. How long before the power company can get here? Another hour, sir. Ajax cursed. We do not want pictures of this on the internet. There'll be power out somewhere. Mojo, too, was staring up at the broken lines, and at the man who'd broken them. Middle-aged, dressed in hiking clothes, his face like a tasteless Halloween mask. How close is the nearest town, village, hamlet? Ajax asked. One of his constables had a map of the national park. Town Yutton is about three miles southwest, he said. All the other places round here are tiny. One street villages. These remote places are used to regular power cuts. Give it a couple of hours, though, and we'll hear about it. Another officer was approaching. Ajax looked beyond him to where a white tent was being erected. Natalie and Raymond's Hastings, sir. The constable carried a clipboard. His job was to match bodies to passengers on the balloon company's list. They both had ID on them. 
I tell you what is starting to puzzle me, though. What's that? Just checked with Rob, who's doing the non-organic inventory. We haven't found a single mobile phone yet. Superintendent Maldonado! Ajax turned. The constable was running towards him from the patrol car at the top of the field. He was panting when he arrived. The woman in the basket, he gasped. Helen Carlton. She's not dead. How in Christ's name did we miss that? Ajax jumped down from the car as the paramedics were carrying the stretched body of Helen Carlton towards the air ambulance. I've rarely seen anyone look more dead. The doctor who'd attended the scene was accompanying the paramedics to the helicopter. I made the same assumption myself, but she seemed warmer than her son and I got an ocular reflex. Where are they taking her, Newcastle? I believe so. Ajax stepped back to let the paramedics load their patient into the ambulance. Then the whole group backed away further as the blades started to spin. She won't live, AJ, said Mojo. Not with injuries like that. Ajax turned to the constable beside him. Any sign of her daughter? Nothing yet, the constable replied. Jane would like a quick word, though. He indicated the young CSI who was hovering by his side. I may be getting a bit ahead of myself, the CSI said as Ajax followed her back towards the crash tree. But I've been having a close look at the inside of the basket, and I'm not sure we've got the full story yet. How do you mean? Ajax stopped a metre short of the basket. She pointed to the middle of the wicker structure, where the pilot had stood. There's blood there, she said, which isn't unexpected given the ferocity of the crash. But there's other organic material as well. Can you see? They're under the leather strap. Ajax looked at the glistening greyish-pink stain. What is it? The CSI looked unsure of herself. I'm far from certain you understand, but it's not impossible, it's brain tissue. And none of the passengers we've recovered had head injuries severe enough to spat a brain tissue around. None that we've found so far, Ajax said. But anyone with a head injury that serious couldn't have walked away, she said, or jumped out of their own accord. You wouldn't think so, Ajax agreed. Keep me posted, won't you? He set off back towards his car. OK. That leaves three missing now, including the pilot. And Poppy, the youngster. It's becoming increasingly urgent that we find them. I want people working with the balloon's ground crew, following the likely course that thing took through the park. If these people jumped out, fell out, or were thrown out, I want us to find them, not a family of picnickers. He reached the car and turned back. What was the name of the woman again? The nun's sister? Jessica Lane, sir. Chapter 24 Ten Years Earlier Bella? Hmm? Do you remember when I was small? I used to creep into your room at night, after I'd had a nightmare. Uh, only too well. Isabel's tone suggested it might not be the happiest of memories, but she'd always liked teasing her sister. I'd lie beside you, listening to your breathing, See that little smile on your face. Oh, you were dreaming that bit. My bedroom was too dark to see anything. Jessica thought for a second. No, I think there must have been a lamp outside. Do you know, you're still the only person I've ever known who smiles while she's asleep. I have to hope your experience of such matters is limited. I used to pretend that if I hugged you for long enough, you'd allow me into those happy dreams of yours. The happy dreams were yours, my dear, never mine. And that street lamp was broken. Ah, uh, 
someone smashed the bulb and it was never repaired. Oh, I remember now, it was Ned. Isabel stood up. We should go. They'll be serving tea. Jessica watched her sister move to the door of the library and pull it open. When they stepped out into the corridor, Isabel strode ahead. She was still so very fit, moved so fast when she wanted to. In her heels and tight skirt, Jessica struggled to keep up. When Mum died, I was sad but never afraid, she said. I still had Dad, who would always make sure I had enough to eat and a warm house to come home to. Hold up, Bella, what's the hurry? Isabel slowed a fraction. Hilda hates us being late. Jess, is this going somewhere? Yes, I'm making a point here. Can you not wait a sec? Isabel kept walking. Most of all, I had you, Jessica said. Overnight, you turned into Mum. I remember you getting up early to pour milk into that tiny bottle for my breakfast. I remember you drawing smiley faces on my Weetabix with raisins, always making sure I went to school with a chocolate biscuit in my bag. They'd reached the door of the recreation room. Isabel turned, her fist clasped tight on the handle. Are you done? Almost. One last question. When you answer it, I'm done. When did it all go wrong, Bella? Why did Dad do what he did? Why did Ned vanish? When are you going to tell me what happened to us? Isabel pulled open the door and let it swing shut. Had Jessica not stuck out her foot in time, it would have slammed in her face. Bella! She snapped in annoyance. Chapter 25 Wednesday the 20th of September She woke herself up, shouting something, maybe her sister's name. She was lying on the earth, overhanging and protruding rocks, sheltering her on three sides. Not in a cave exactly, but the approximation of one. She had no idea how she came to be there. Then the jumble of noise and images came back and the crash replayed in her head as a nauseating mix of violence, blistering heat, and screaming. She remembered, or thought she did, hanging in the tree for what felt like hours, listening to the leaves whisper and the wind moan. Maybe it hadn't been the wind moaning. She remembered scrambling and falling through branches, with torn clothes and bleeding fingers, and people... Faces swimming in front of her barely conscious mind. A sweet teenage boy. Hikers in brightly coloured anoraks. A terrified woman who wouldn't stop screaming. Who were all these people? And why did she feel so certain they were all dead? She sat up, nausea and pain battling for attention. She'd banged her head in the crash. A dull ache had spread over most of her skull, and somewhere behind her left temple she could feel a sickening pounding. People weren't supposed to sleep after head injuries. Tiredness was often a sign of internal damage. Maybe the crash had killed her, too. Maybe she was on borrowed time. A dead woman walking. Oblivious to the clock relentlessly ticking away her last remaining minutes. She remembered finding her sister. Her lovely face burned. Her slender neck broken. And the barking of a dog, feeling sure the man on the quad bike was coming back. She'd fled into the woods over a rise, then along what looked like an animal track. She'd walked for hours. Or maybe it had only been a few minutes. She held her breath, listening for the sound of the quad bike or the dog but the world beyond her cave was silent. By her side was a rucksack that she had never seen before. Had she brought it with her from the crash site? Had she found it here? Blue, with black zips. It wasn't hers. 
and yet she realised she knew what was inside. A bottle of water, peanut butter chocolate, a sweater, green. She could put it on now, she was so cold. She drew the zip and pulled it open. She was right. Everything she'd expected to find was there. Also a wallet with money and keys. Did she have a car? She remembered or thought she did driving a small silver one. She had no idea where it was. Driving through the pre-dawn darkness, seeing fire on the horizon. Exceptional excitement. Had that been today? She crawled out of her shelter. A mist had formed while she'd been sleeping, and visibility had reduced to a few metres in each direction. The ground at her feet, though, told her she was on the steeply sloping side of a hill. It was still daytime, but the light beyond the mist was dull and flat. She had no idea which direction was north, south, east or west, whether she should turn right, left or go straight on. Don't be dead, she murmured, not entirely sure to whom she was speaking. No one answered. Loneliness hit her like a burden she'd have to carry for the rest of her days. She set off walking, downhill because it was easier. Chapter 26 Officially, the Farr family lived in Castle Farr, a stone-built, rendered house in the hamlet of Kirk Yetton in the Scottish borders. Unofficially, none of the family slept in any of the house's four bedrooms. The bedrooms were kept for another purpose entirely, and the family lived in caravans parked around the yard at the back. A high steel fence encircled the house, the caravans and the yard. Dogs slunk around the perimeter, night and day, stealing through the shadows, always on the march for a stray fox, a sly rabbit or a stupid human. Beyond the fence lay a thin strip of woodland. Beyond that, the ground had been quarried in the past. Now it lay in odd hillocks and hollows, grass-covered, like a weird alien landscape. The family's collection of piebald and skewbald ponies grazed here. They weren't supposed to, but the owner had given up objecting. It wasn't as though he had any other use for the land, and no sensible man got on the wrong side of the farce. A boy spotted the quad bike and pulled the gates open. Patrick drove through and steered round the campfire to the biggest caravan at the back of the house his mother's. The cloying smell of calla gas heating, mingled with the rich rose oil perfume she used, hit him the moment he opened the door. Directly ahead, at eye level on the caravan wall, was a black-and-white photograph of a horse-drawn caravan with a black-eyed gypsy woman in the driving seat. His great-grandmother, his ma always claimed, although Charles swore he could remember her buying the picture in a junk shop. His mother's caravan held as much furniture as the floor space allowed. Some of it was fitted, much of it just squeezed in anyhow. Her favourite floral fabrics, none of which matched, were everywhere. She, his brothers and two uncles, were drinking tea. She didn't allow alcohol before the sun went down, although there were many times he'd smelled it on her breath. She was playing an odd game with six dice that she'd never agreed to explain to any of her sons. Tell me, she said, without looking up. Two bodies still missing. Three, including the one in the back of your car. Two people still missing. She slammed the dice down hard on the table. We don't know they're dead. Men or women. Women. One in her thirties. The other just a kid. Names? Jessica Lane. Poppy Carlton. Do we know what they look like? Not yet. Working on it. Mary reached across the stained wood veneer of the table for a dog-eared road atlas and opened it at a pre-marked page. 
Patrick drew closer and saw the National Park. She'd drawn a bullseye around the spot where the balloon came down. We need to get out there. She turned to her brothers. Take everyone. If these two lasses are alive, they're lost or injured, or they would have got to help by now. Someone should follow the valley. People head for running water when they're lost. Take the dogs. Ma, the place will be crawling with police, Charles said. Dress like walkers. The park's always full of them, daft fuckers. And someone needs to stay on the road. Drive up and down, keep a lookout. What are you going to do? William asked, the only one brave enough or stupid enough. She raised her eyebrows. I'm going to stay here, make myself a light lunch and coordinate operations. Is there a reason you lot are still here? The other men got up. How do you get on? Patrick said to his uncle. Is she? Tommy, together with Uncle Jeremy, had been tasked with getting the unconscious girl from that morning to hospital. Died an hour after we got there, he said. In certain now. You were fucking lucky. Fucking psycho, more like, said William as he pushed his way out. When the caravan door closed, Mary stared at her youngest son. Right, what are you not telling me? He sighed. Someone was taking the hospital. She put her hands on the table. Her fingernails were dirty. Every finger held at least one silver ring. Someone you missed? He shook his head. Ma, she looked dead. She should have been dead. Where have they taken her? Newcastle General. Went by helicopter. Pity you couldn't bring that down as well. He said nothing. She closed her eyes and sighed heavily. You better get over there. No point. She'll be in surgery. I'll go later, if need be. She's not expected to come through it. She swiped at him again, but he was too far away. Better pray she doesn't, you fucking fool. Chapter 27 A shape emerged from the fog, too straight to be a tree, too thin to be a human. She stumbled over the rough ground towards it, not allowing herself to hope. She'd lost track of time as though the day itself, shrouded in thick mist and misery, had given up on the concept. It seemed so long ago that she and her sister had driven through the pre-dawn darkness, seen the balloon's fire glow against the black sky, climbed aboard as the night had given way to silver light, then to the rosy dawn. So long ago since the world had been as it should be. Now the world was about sorrow and soggy grey twilight. Now it was about weariness and a thick, gloopy mass in her head that was stopping her thinking properly. She'd drunk the water and eaten the peanut butter chocolate from her backpack and promptly thrown up both. She needed to drink again and was close to exhaustion, and for all she knew she'd been going round in circles since she left the cave. The mist had stolen any sense of direction she might have had if the world had been visible. The shadowy form ahead was taking substance. It was a path sign, pointing in two opposite directions. She couldn't read the writing until she was almost upon it. Welcome to England, said the arrow pointing one way. Welcome to Scotland, said the other. The spongy mass in her head lightened a little as she realised where she was. By chance, she'd stumbled across an ancient pilgrim's trail, one that led some sixty miles from Melrose in the Scottish borders to Lindisfarne off the Northumbrian coast. She was on St Cuthbert's Way. England or Scotland? 
She lived in England. Home was in England. It wasn't a question, really. Chapter 28 Eight Years Earlier Jessica reached out to brush her fingers against the last of the crossing posts, and a fraction of it crumbled away beneath her touch. When she brought her hand to her face, she could smell brine and the long green tendrils the tide had left behind. She opened her mouth to speak, and felt a completely unexpected tightness in her throat. And so St Cuthbert arrived upon Holy Island and blessed it, said Isabel, who'd been walking at her side, whistling and humming for most of the last few miles of their three-day hike. And when he rose from his knees, he said, No way am I doing that god-awful walk again. I'm staying put. You fuckers can build me an abbey. That's a lovely story, said Jessica. The damp, puddle-strewn, densely packed sand they'd walked over was gaining substance as they neared land. Rocks were appearing, becoming more frequent, then clumps of dry, sharp grass. They were almost there. Jessica glanced back at the seven other women, all of them dressed in black like Isabel, who were walking with them. It was lucky, given her sister's language, that they were all still some distance back across the sand. They reached the line of rocks that edged the road, and Jessica stepped over them onto the tarmac. Ah, Lindisfarne. She tried the beautiful word out on her tongue and repeated it for good measure. I'm actually quite moved. A mile or so away, over the low rise of the island, she could see the tip of the hilltop castle. Just around a bend or two along this narrow road would be the abbey. Isabel, meanwhile, was sitting on a rock, emptying the sand out of one stout black shoe and banging it down hard. In spite of the company I find myself in, Jessica added. Isabel raised her face to catch the wind. I'm kidding, she said, taking several deep breaths. I love this trip, if only for the chance to get out for a few days. Jessica looked across the sand to where the sea was a gleam on the horizon. And is it your job to know the tide times? Because, you know, those photographs of submerged cars were scary. How long have we got? Lindisfarne, or Holy Island, wasn't a true island as such, but formed by tides. At low water, it could be reached across a mile-long stretch of sand marked by tall posts. Visitors were warned against crossing the sand, unless in the company of an experienced guide, because when the tide returned, the path quickly became submerged. Most pedestrian visitors to Lindisfarne took the safer causeway route, although even on the road, cars were regularly stranded and sometimes swept away. Isabel was pulling her shoelace tight. Loads of time, she said. Reg will be here already with the bus, and Hilda will be waiting in St Aidan's to give thanks for our safe crossing. Half an hour on our knees, a quick bowl of soup in the village hall, and we'll have you back before dusk. They had to be about fifteen minutes ahead of the rest of the party, taking advantage of the privacy. Jessica sat down beside her sister. She said, Bella, do you ever think about Ned? For the longest time, Isabel didn't reply, and the other nuns drew nearer. I left that life behind a long time ago, Isabel said at last. I have a new family now, a family in God, and you really should call me Sister Maria Magdalena. You might slip up sometime and call me Bella in front of Mother Hildegard. Brenda told me he left the army, and that she lost track of him after that, Jessica said. I was just wondering if you'd ever heard from him. Isabel's face had clenched tight. No, how could I? No one knows where I am, 
apart from you, Aunt Brenda and Uncle Rob. No one. Take it easy. What does it matter? You're in a convent, not a satanic cult. Unusually clumsy, getting tangled in her habit, Isabel scrambled to her feet. I don't want to talk about this again, she said. She waved at the others, still crossing the sand, and raised her arm, waggling her thumb this way and that. Everyone okay? When she had an answering gesture from the woman at the head of the line, she turned again and set off along the damp coastal road towards the town. As always, Jessica had to walk slightly faster than she was comfortable with to keep up. Chapter 29 Wednesday the 20th of September So what are you saying? The pilot committed suicide. He jumped out. John Jones, acting chief constable of Northumbria Police and Ajax's immediate boss, pushed his chair back, away from the desk. It's one possibility, sir, Ajax said. No sign of his body anywhere near the balloon. Evidence that one of the other passengers took over the job of trying to fly it and made some serious errors. The ground crew are adamant the crash probably wouldn't have happened and certainly wouldn't have been as bad as it was if Sean Allen had been on board and functioning. Ajax wondered again whether he really should share CSI Jane's theory about the brain tissue. But no sign of his body, the chief asked. Jane hadn't been certain. Better to wait a while. The search and rescue helicopter has flown over the likely route of the balloon a couple of times and found nothing, he said instead. We've also got a team on the ground. And dogs. Presumably we've got people going to his home. Looking for notes. Ajax glanced at the clock. Gone two o'clock and he was starving. Mr. and Mrs. Allen, the pilot's parents, insist he was fine, in good health and a good frame of mind. But when I pushed them a bit harder, I found out that he and his wife divorced a year ago, and that it hadn't exactly been amicable. They may have been undiagnosed depression, feelings of anger. The chief turned towards the window. Are they still looking? It's vile out there. They called back the helicopter when the mists came down but they hope to get out as soon as it clears. Well, if he did jump out, they'll find him. Sighing deeply, Ajax stepped further into the room. Thing is, though, sir, they may not. Not immediately. The balloons tend to fly over Harcourt Lake, and it's a bit of a thing with the pilots to fly as low as they can over water. Not strictly legal, from what I understand, but they do it all the same, well, I'm thinking, what if he leapt out as they went over the lake? The chief's dark eyebrows crept closer together. He wouldn't die. Or what if he had some weights in his pockets? That lake is deep. I wouldn't put money on our dredging something out of it any time soon. I heard something about no mobile phones being found. Isn't that odd? Giving in, Ajax pulled out a chair and sat down. I've been thinking about that, and I'm not so sure. Once those people knew the balloon was in trouble, their first instinct would have been to pull out their phones and try to summon help. The signal is bad in the park, so they'd have had to keep trying. If their phones were in their hands when the crash happened, they could have flown some distance. I'm sure we'll find most of them in the next few hours. The chief said, And two bodies still missing. Ajax glanced down at his notes. Uh, two females. Fifteen-year-old Poppy Carlton and a woman called Jessica Lane. Probably dead, given the state the others were in. But I suppose we can't rule anything out. Helen Carlton's still hanging on, or was, thirty minutes ago. He suddenly realised how still the chief had become. You all right, sir? The boss dropped his eyes. Run those names by me again. 
uh, Poppy Carlton, Jessica Lane. Another silence. Longer this time. Ajax looked towards the door. Then the boss mumbled something. Sorry, sir, Ajax said. I... I knew her, Jessica Lane. The boss was talking to his desk. Long time ago. He looked up. Uh, what else do we know about her? Ajax opened his notebook. Mid to late thirties, five, six-ish, slim, dark, shoulder-length hair, wearing a bright green jacket. This is all from the staff at the balloon company. Gave her address as York, and her next of kin as Sister Maria Magdalena of Winding Priory, just outside Fenham on the coast. The chief got up and turned to the window. He stood, his back to Ajax, staring at the rain-streaked glass. What relation was the nun to Jessica? Do we know? he asked. Her sister, I think. Ajax watched his boss's shoulders stiffen. And the sister is at this priory. Well, Fenham's not far, is it? Opposite Holy Island, if I'm right. Has someone been out to inform her? Ah, the sister was in the balloon, too. The trip was a present for her fortieth birthday. We found her body quickly. Sir, is it the same Jessica Lane, do you think? Did you know her? The chief spun round. Nah. He pulled his chair out again. Mine would be much older than late thirties. She was older than me. Common name, I guess. Okay, what else you got? The bodies have all been taken to Newcastle General. The post-mortems will start tomorrow, but may take a couple of days to complete. The basket is on its way to the lab. If these two females survived, we really need to find them quickly, said the chief. They'll definitely know what happened, and they could be in a very vulnerable state. What do you need to keep the search going overnight? Well, I've spoken to Air Rescue, but they don't recommend flying at night in these circumstances. Visibility can be zero, and the heat-detecting equipment is of limited use with so many sheep around. The chief nodded but reluctantly, it seemed. Huh. First light, then. What about the dog teams? As I said, still out there. The park authorities have people looking, too. We should do what we can to find these people. We'll do our best, although... Ajax didn't finish the thought. There was no need. If that's everything, sir, I really should see how the team is getting on with alerting next of kin. And I need to get out to Winding Priory before too much longer. The boss was staring at him in a vacant manner. Uh, they haven't been answering the phone, Ajax went on. Closed order, from what I can gather, and silent. They don't speak from one day to the next but someone has to tell them that Sister Maria won't be home for evening prayers. Winding. Out by Fenham. That's right, so can I? Of course. Off you go. Ajax turned. Wait a minute, Ajax. His hand had been on the door. Sir? He turned back slowly. Are you okay? I, I keep meaning to ask how you're doing. But you always seem so together, not to mention busy. This has bothered you, though, hasn't it? Ajax picked his words carefully. Not what I was expecting this morning, sir. But I think that's the nature of disasters. Eh, quite. So, you're off to see the nuns. Right. Thanks, Ajax. Keep me posted. Ajax looked round as the door closed. The boss was back at the window, staring at a rain-streaked, opaque sheet of glass. Chapter 30 
On she walked, through long grass that soaked her shoes, then her socks. She walked when all feeling in her feet seemed to evaporate. When her mud-clogged footwear became nothing more than burdens to be dragged along with each step. She walked as the damp air seeped through the thin fabric of her clothes, and the curls in her hair became limp and heavy, clinging to her neck like seaweed to a rock. For a while she tried to keep track of distance and time, counting steps, looking out for any sign of the sun, but at some point she gave up doing both, and when she cast her mind back, she couldn't remember when or why, but thought probably it was when the voices began. They'd started quietly. A low cry from behind, a whispered curse just beyond her left shoulder. She'd ignored them, telling herself they were nothing more than temporary manifestations of shock and a blow to the head. But still they clamoured for her attention. Voices of the hungry, the footsore, the weary, all of those who'd walked the path before her. Some sang, some prayed, some muttered confessions in low, angry voices. Sometimes the voices were in old dialect that she couldn't understand. Other times they spoke of TV programmes that had been aired within the last year. For a while, her dead sister kept pace alongside, telling her stories of when the two of them were young, and then, when the waves of nausea in her stomach had finally ceded ground to pangs of hunger, she heard singing. I'll make him once relent His first avowed intent To be a pilgrim More phantom voices. She looked to both sides, down the hill. It was still raining. Cloud cover was low and the day was overcast. The mist of earlier, though, had faded as the day had worn on. There was a burst of laughter. Then the choir, real or imaginary, began the second verse, one strong tenor voice taking the lead. Ooh, so beset him round with dismal stories. The singers were getting closer, had been following her along the path. Then a head wrapped in the hood of a yellow coat appeared, climbing the hill towards her. Another coloured hood joined it, then a third. At least two of them were men. The man. There was a man looking for her. This was a big group. Was he among them? She hadn't heard a bike engine, but maybe he was craftier than that. Why did he want her exactly? The man in front, the lead tenor, was in his early sixties. He carried a walking stick fashioned from a long branch that had the look of a wizard's staff. The man to his left was older, smaller and thinner. The woman on his right portly and red-faced. Ten people in the group. None looked like him, but... The man in front saw her and held up his hand for silence as they drew close. His face was large and all the lines on it curved upwards. Greetings. Good afternoon to you, fellow pilgrim. He was Welsh. Hello? She croaked back, her eyes going from one face to the next. If he were here, she couldn't run away. She wasn't sure how much further she could walk. You don't look dressed for the weather, if you don't mind my saying so. And you've ripped that lovely jacket of yours. She followed his eyeline and saw that the sleeve of her jacket was badly torn. Did you take a tumble? One of the women asked. You're covered in cuts and bruises and wet through. They were crowding her, circling her like a pack of wolves. They meant to be kind, at least she thought they did, but she wished they'd just... Well, we can do something about that. 
another of the women stepped forward, pulling her rucksack off her shoulders. Okay, everyone, said the Welshman. Take a breather. Nick, do we have any coffee left for this young lady, who looks frozen to death? Here. The woman in the red anorak was holding out a waterproof jacket. It's a spare, she said. Go on. It won't get you dry, but it'll keep some heat in. Oh, no, I, I couldn't. Course you could. The tenor was handing her coffee in a thin plastic cup. We're probably staying at the same place tonight, aren't we? The youth hostel in Woola. You can give it back then. That's a nasty tear. The woman in the red anorak seemed fixated on her jacket. Did you catch it on something? She closed her eyes, had a sudden flashback of crashing through trees, of branches scratching and clawing. Steady on. A hand gripped her arm. Have some coffee and get this coat on warm up a bit. The anorak on offer was thin but large. It would cover her head, come down almost to her thighs, would keep her dry for the rest of the day. Thank you, she said. She raised the coffee to her lips, found it exactly the right temperature to drink, and practically poured it down her throat. Now, do you need some help? the tenor said. More than we can give you, I mean. We're in the middle of nowhere here, but we all have phones. I'm sure we can contact the authorities if you need us to. Authorities? What did that even mean? Who were the authorities? She had to go home. Let her sister know she was all right. Home was this way, wasn't it? She looked beyond the tenor to the slope of the hill and the trees in the distance. Trees. A terrible crash. Torn fabric of the balloon. People screaming. Her sister was dead. Everyone was dead. Maybe she was too. Maybe she was nothing but a ghost, and even that shadowy image was slipping away now, fading before their eyes. And that was the reason they were looking at her in alarm. I think she needs to sit down. Get on the phone, Jeff. See if we can get someone out here. Someone? Who? Who were they phoning? They looked kind, but how could she know for sure? I'm fine, she said, surprised at how loud and clear she sounded. Really? I'm okay now. Thank you. They weren't convinced. She could tell from their puzzled frowns and sneaky little glances at each other. She couldn't let them phone. They might phone him. You're so kind, she said, handing the cup back. God bless you. The tenor beamed. My name's Jeff, and this is my wife, Hannah. I tell you the names of the rest of this bunch of reprobates, but I don't want to overload you. We're from the Baptist Church in Little Crinton in Buckinghamshire, and I know that's already far more information than you looked for. He wanted a smile from her. She could tell from the expectant way he was staring at her. She pressed the corners of her mouth outwards in response. And you would be? He wanted her name. Why did he need to know her name? Maria. She said the first thing that came into her head. Why had she said that? Maria was not her name. Now don't take this wrong, but are you going all the way? Oh, for goodness sake, Jeff. His wife poked him in the arm. She'd walked this way before. Where did the path lead to again? I'm going to Lindisfarne, she said. A holy island. Splendid. Well, we'll see you along the way, no doubt. Although we have some very elderly folk in this group, don't we, Steve? And we might not be able to keep up with a youngster like yourself. But we'd welcome your company at any time. 
he half turned away and seemed to think again. Come to think of it, I think you'd better stay with us for a while, till you feel a bit more sprightly. The man's wife, Hannah, was pressing another cup of coffee on her. By the time she'd finished it, the group were ready to move on and determined to take her with them. They set off, the downhill slope making the going easier, the hot coffee she'd drunk helping. She walked at the back of the group, reluctant to intrude, but two ladies in the rear attached themselves to either side of her. Were you at town Yetham last night? one of them asked. I don't remember seeing you at the plough. Humbug? She took the sweet gratefully. I was, but I stayed with a friend. Someone I went on a retreat with last year. She felt a moment of surprise. Who'd have thought she'd prove such a good liar? And why was she lying anyway? Why did she not just tell them what had happened? What had happened, exactly? They told us it was haunted, said the woman on the other side. But the only thing that kept me awake was Jeff snoring. <laughs> Have a toffee. I don't care for humbugs myself. Thank you. The toffee joined the humbug in her mouth tell a group of complete strangers that she'd lost everything, and that she wasn't sure how she was going to make it through the next hour, never mind the rest of her life, and that someone had tried to kill her and might try again if he found her, and that the crash had been her fault. No, th that wasn't right, was it? How could it have been her fault? She was going home. These people would help her get home. That was all that mattered now. They walked on, and she said nothing. She found that she could keep up with the group easily. Most were in their late fifties or early sixties, and their pace was slowed further by Jeff's insistence on regular stops to admire the view, to tell them stories from St Cuthbert's life, or to sing an impromptu hymn. On the next rise, Jeff called them to a halt. A group coming the other way, he said. That's unusual. A reverse pilgrimage. Satanists, muttered the woman with the humbugs, grinning gleefully at a group of six people heading up the path towards them. Unlike the pilgrims, they weren't walking in ones and twos, but were spread out beyond the path for several metres on each side. They look like a search party, said the man by Jeff's side. Oh, funny sort of search party. The worst kind of search party. They were searching for her. The man at the head of the group wore a trilby and a loose leather jacket. His hair was dark, curling to his shoulders. In spite of the weather, his jacket was open to reveal a low-necked white vest. Even without the distinctive clothes she would have known his short, squat shape, his lurching way of moving, the way his hands clenched into fists and then uncurled into grasping talons as he walked. He was here. This was him. He'd found her. His German shepherd trotted along, unleashed at his side. It was a massive dog even with fur clinging damply to its sides. As they drew closer, she could see that around the man's neck he wore a heavy gold cross on a chain. He carried what could have been a walking stick, but in the way he was swinging it looked more like a club. Immediately behind him was a man with short hair and a dark beard. This one wore a padded coat, his hands thrust deep into his pockets. Apart from one woman with very long blonde hair, they were all young men. He had people. He wasn't alone. She glanced back. Hiding was impossible. Running out of the question. She closed her eyes and saw again the carnage at the crash site, 
heard the sound of a woman's head being broken. Just by being with this group, she'd brought them into terrible danger. She'd seen what this man was capable of. Oblivious to the peril he was in, Jeff led them down the hill, his head held high, maintaining a conversation with Nick. The others, though, had fallen silent. A nervousness had crept over them. Who would true valour see? Let him come hither, she sang quietly. She saw several glances turn her way, a couple of smiles. She'd always had a nice singing voice. The effort was robbing her of breath she badly needed, but something told her to keep singing. The group coming up the hill were almost upon them. One here will constant be. Jeff had joined in, followed quickly by Hannah and all the others. Come, wind, come, weather. Good afternoon. Jeff stepped off the track, politely letting the others pass. The rest of his group followed. She did the same, pressing close to the humbug lady. She ran a finger around the rim of her hood to make sure her hair was hidden, and then tucked it quickly into her pocket, so no one would see how much her hand was shaking. Have you come from Holy Island? Jeff asked the man in the trilby. The man stared at him for a second. We're looking for some people, he said, in a voice that was deep and coarse, as though his throat was sore. Couple of young women. You seen anyone lost? On their own? Maybe hurt? She waited for the group to turn towards her. To give her away with thoughtless glances. No one did. And a couple of young women. Someone else was alive. Or maybe it was a trick. To see how she reacted. Make her think her sister had survived after all. Was it even possible? I can't say that we have. Jeff spoke loudly and decisively. We set off from town Yetum this morning with a church group from Liverpool. Lovely people, but they walked a lot faster than we do, and they left us behind. Apart from that, I can swear to the Lord I haven't seen a soul other than this group. It was not possible. She had seen her sister's dead face, felt her wrist for a glimmer of a pulse. The man in the trilby stared at Jeff for a second, then walked past, scanning the faces around him. Anyone see anything? His accent was Scottish, but with a hint of something else, something that made her think of hot, dusty countries very far away. He seemed to be breathing deeply, too, through his nose, as though trying to pick up a scent. Her heart began to bang against the inside of her ribcage. These girls might be hurt, he went on. Might need some help. He was in the middle of the group now. A few seconds more, and he'd be staring directly into her face. He'd know her then. The dog was at her feet, more interested in her than anyone else, almost as though greeting an old friend. He would spot that. The dog raised its nose and nuzzled the pocket of her jacket. She longed to push it away, but knew any sort of movement would attract attention. She wasn't sure how much longer she could stand up. We'll be sure to help anyone we come across, said Jeff. Good luck to you. Jeff set off again, down the hill. Others followed. The search party was watching them go, scanning faces. She made herself keep her eyes and her head up. She passed within two feet of the man with the trilby, and could have sworn she heard him sniff the air as she walked by. "'Can your dog have a biscuit?' The humbug lady was reaching inside her enormous pockets. 
the dog, either reacting to the word biscuit or smelling something in the depths of the pocket, loped towards her. We don't feed him when he's working. The man in the trilby had moved on, distracted by his dog. He's not a pet. Oh, you're a good boy, aren't you? Hmm? A very good boy. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Humbug Lady bend bravely to pet the dog and its tail wag in response. The man with the padded coat passed by, then the woman with blonde hair. There was a resemblance amongst these people, a similarity, as though they were one family. The pilgrims were all walking again now, past the group of searchers, back on the path. Still, she couldn't let herself breathe. It would only take one of them to say, You know what, mate, there was something odd about the one in the blue anorak. Let's have another look at her. Keep walking. One foot in front of the other. Keep going. Don't like the look of that lot, said the toffee lady once they were safely out of earshot. Might be a good idea not to look back, called Jeff, just loud enough for the walkers at the back to hear. It's usually taken as a sign of aggression, and we wouldn't want that now, would we? She didn't look back but all the way down the hill and up the next rise, she could feel eyes upon her. He was looking for her. He knew she'd survived the crash. He would keep looking. Chapter 31 When Ajax pulled up at the gates of Winding Priory, they were closed and locked. There was no intercom, not even a bell. To either side of the gates, a tall stone wall stretched out as far as he could see along the road. And the gates of heaven shall be closed unto thee, said Mojo. Let's not pretend you've ever opened a Bible. Ajax sounded the horn. No one's going to hear that. He got out of the car. The wind was coming straight from the sea, and the air seemed to swim with particles of sulphur and brine. He closed his eyes for a second, felt the damp on his face and licked salt off his lips. The convent building was less than a quarter of a mile from the coast. Its grounds ran right up to the dunes. In the most sparsely populated county in England, he couldn't imagine a more isolated spot. There were few trees, and the dried-up barren moorland around him seemed to stretch forever. The road he was parked on didn't even merit bee status, and was known to flood regularly during heavy rain. There were no other homes or buildings within five miles. According to the woman in the nearest post office, from whom he'd asked directions, the sisters kept one car, that was rarely seen, in the closest village. When the nuns appeared, they did so on bicycles. Already the light was fading. He'd been kept later in the office than he'd have wanted, and had got caught in rush-hour traffic on the way over. It was gone six in the evening, and he had a feeling religious houses kept early hours. He approached the gate. The main priory building was about two hundred metres away, down a weed-ridden gravel drive. The building looked late Elizabethan, although he knew there had been a religious house on this site for over eight hundred years. It was dark grey stone, with a black slate roof. The adjoining chapel boasted a miniature tower, topped with a statue of Christ. The windows were small and paned. Through the fading light he could see a billowing black robe making its way towards him. "'O oh, ye of little faith!' he called back over his shoulder. The nun, a tiny woman in her early sixties, had a gentle smile on her face as she pulled a large key from her pocket and unlocked the padlock. She didn't look directly at either Ajax or the car. Ajax went forward to help her pull open the gates, but she stepped back and held up both hands, stopping him in his tracks. She shook her head. She still hadn't made eye contact. 
silent order, hissed Mojo from the car. I'll bet she's not allowed to speak. The nun pulled open one gate, then the other, and gestured that he should move forward. Ajax drove through and stopped again. He waited until she'd closed and locked the gates, and then jumped out and held open the rear door of the car, wishing he thought to clear it of empty crisp packets and discarded papers. The slight smile, less gentle and more creepy by the second, didn't falter, but the nun shook her head and walked past him. She began to walk sedately back to the house, directly down the centre of the drive. There was no way he could drive past her. He would have to follow in her wake. You have to be kidding me. Mojo was laughing quietly. I think we play by their rules here. Just be grateful the drive isn't half a mile long. Ajax started the engine and released the handbrake. The nun was twenty metres away. This is absurd, he said, running a hand through his hair. Give her a toot. I can't toot a nun. There's space to drive round her. Over there, grass. There'll be a special place in hell. Seeing no alternative, Ajax put the car into first gear and pulled forward. Mojo sat upright. I'm going to get out and walk with her. Bet you I can get her to talk before we get to the house. Please don't make me activate the child lock. He regretted saying it the second the words left his mouth. Even now one couldn't mention children. The possibility of children in her life to Mojo. She shrank down into her seat, and he knew it would be some time before she spoke again. The nun's steady pace never wavered, and Ajax crawled along behind her. When they reached the house, he stopped the car and jumped out. Not expecting the nun to speak, he allowed her to approach the large wooden panelled front door and open it. She disappeared inside, leaving it open behind her, just as a high-pitched, unearthly screeching sounded close by. What the hell was that? Mojo muttered, shocked out of her sulk. Ajax stepped back and looked around. Nothing. Except maybe... There was a high stone wall to the right of the convent, some twenty metres away, and something large was perched on top of it. Not a statue, definitely not a statue. It was moving, sliding sideways along the top of the wall. The hideous cry sounded again, echoing around the turrets of the old building. Don't mind the peacocks, said a low, mellow voice from inside the building. They'll be roosting soon. Please, come in. The peacock spread its fabulous black and turquoise tail and jumped down from the wall. It began strutting towards them as the smell of stale cooking drifted out through the door, reminding Ajax of school dinners and of the time he'd been forced to eat parsnips before vomiting on the dinner lady's shoes. Another nun was waiting in the hallway. Ajax held up his warrant card and introduced himself. Behind him, unusually quietly, Mojo did the same. The nun pushed thick rimmed spectacles further up her nose and examined his card. She did not offer to shake hands. I'm Mother Hildegard. Welcome to Winding Priory. Mother Hildegard was tall and solidly built, possibly in her early seventies, although her barely lined face wasn't easy to read. Behind the spectacles her eyes were a soft grey. A milky white cloth framed her face, and her black clothes flowed almost to the flagged floor. The cross around her neck was gold, bigger and more elaborate than the one they'd found around the neck of Sister Maria Magdalena. She was looking at him curiously. He watched her frown, her mouth turned down. Then she stepped forward. She raised her left hand and placed it gently on his forehead, making the sign of the cross with her other hand and muttering a blessing. 
he was too surprised to speak. I hope you don't mind. She stepped back and looked deep into his eyes. I was moved to do it. I'm not sure why. You seem in need. Ajax found himself oddly touched. I've not had the best of days. And I don't mind. I was raised a Catholic. I know that. Hildegard turned on her heels and they followed her across the hall to a wide wooden staircase with carved balusters. She went up. They followed. At the top of the first flight, she led them into a large room, furnished as an office. A wooden desk, old but not antique, was close to the window. Bookshelves lined the walls. A Bible stood on its own lectern to one side of the desk. There were four armchairs, covered in a floral fabric that might have been fashionable in the 1980s, and a small patterned rug on an otherwise plain wooden floor. The room smelled like the houses of old people, of an elderly lady's sweat. Mother Hildegard gestured that her guests were to sit, then joined them. I expect you've come to tell me about Sister Maria Magdalena's death. It was kind of you to do so. I'm sure it must have been a very busy day for you. Well, that made things a bit easier. You must have seen it on the news, Ajax said. About the balloon crush, I mean. She smiled again, a smile of endless patience. We do have a television set in the convent house. It's kept in the recreation room, but the sisters prefer to spend the hour or so of allotted time watching comedy shows. They're very fond of Father Ted, and the Big Bang Theory is a great favourite, because one of our sisters used to teach physics, and the rest of us enjoy watching her roar with laughter at the science jokes. We don't see the news, though. We're at either Vespers or Compline when the news programme is broadcast. Then how? Sister Maria Magdalena was due to be back at twelve noon. Trips outside the convent are very rarely permitted, and times have to be adhered to very strictly. Had there been an unavoidable delay, Sister would have telephoned my office. I have a telephone answering machine for when I'm not here. She looked at her watch. That was nearly seven hours ago, during which time I've had several messages from your colleagues. I knew something terrible must have happened. I'm sorry to tell you that you're right. The balloon came down unexpectedly. We found Sister Maria Magdalena's body at the crash site. I'm very sorry for your loss. Hildegard crossed herself and closed her eyes for a second. I was very uncomfortable about that trip, but I always hated saying no to Jessica. Her eyes opened wide in alarm. Jessica, she said. Her sister Jessica. You knew Jessica, too? Of course. She's been visiting for years. She comes most months, sometimes twice a month. I feel I've watched her grow up. Such a sweet girl, and so... Oh! Oh, my goodness! The nun dropped her face into her hands. Ajax could feel Mojo giving him that look, the one that always made him think she was about to bite something, or someone. With an obvious effort... Hildegard composed herself. Her hands, when she dropped them, were damp. Please excuse me, she said. Human frailty never leaves us, however much we might try to dispel it. I was very fond of Jessica. We haven't found Jessica's body, said Ajax, so we don't know for certain, but it would be dishonest to tell you I'm hopeful. Of the thirteen people on board, nine have been confirmed dead. Another is critically ill in hospital. A tear rolled down the old nun's cheek. Somewhere in the house a bell began to toll. Ajax suppressed a shudder as Hildegard got to her feet. 
Vespers is about to begin. I never miss it. We will pray for the souls of everyone on that ill-fated balloon. God bless you, Superintendent. Sister Winifred will show you to the gate. For a second her eyes drifted to the chair on which Mojo was sitting. She frowned, and then forced another smile. God bless you, she repeated, her eyes wavering. Ajax remained in his seat. Mother Hildegard, I'm very sorry to intrude on your sorrow, but I'm afraid I do need a little more of your time. The nun pulled back her shoulders. The sisters will be expecting me. Nevertheless, please sit back down. Chapter 32 Towards the end of the afternoon, they walked down the last of the hills, crossed one more field, and climbed the final stile to reach Wooler. In spite of having walked up hills and over rough ground for several hours, she was feeling better. Her headache hadn't gone, but had gradually become more bearable in the cool, fresh air. Her body was stiff and sore, but the walking had helped, if anything. As the group of pilgrims made their way down the high street, she spoke the words she'd been silently rehearsing for the past half hour. I need to catch the post office before it closes, she said to the woman who'd lent her the coat. Can I return your jacket at the youth hostel later? Of course. Perhaps you can join us for dinner? Thank you. She turned away, was about to hurry down the street when she felt a hand on her shoulder. Jeff asked, Is there anything we can do to help you? in a voice unusually subdued for him. His kindness was disarming, and for a second she wanted nothing more than to tell him everything. But she was so close now. From Wooler she could get a bus, a taxi, make phone calls. You already have, she replied. I'll see you this evening. She waited for him to say that he would look forward to it, because that was the sort of thing he said. He didn't. He put a hand on her shoulder again. God bless you, he said, before steering his group down the street. Watching them go felt like standing on ice, seeing the last crack form, and knowing the fall was inevitable. In the post office she bought a single envelope. She ripped a page from a notepad on the counter and scribbled a few words. She sealed the envelope and then carefully, in case she should meet anyone from the group of pilgrims, she made her way to the youth hostel. She left the envelope addressed to Jeff and went outside again. A hundred metres down the street, beside a telephone box, the man wearing the loose leather jacket and the trilby was climbing out of a Land Rover. The man in the blue padded coat got out of the passenger seat. She stepped back into the youth hostel doorway, out of sight, and watched the man with the trilby walk down the street. He stopped the first person he met, and they spoke for a few seconds. She saw the person, an elderly woman, shake her head, and the man moved on. Meanwhile, the man in the blue coat was heading her way. A woman with lots of blonde hair had climbed down from the back of the Land Rover, and was crossing the street. How stupid she'd been. There were so few towns and villages in this part of the county. They were bound to look in one of the biggest. She slipped out of the doorway and began walking away from the town centre. St Cuthbert's Way left Wooler along the B6348. By the time she left the road to head northeast across open countryside, the light was fading. Her headache was back. She was trembling from lack of food, and the voices of the dead were gathering about her again. Chapter 33 Hildegard used the backs of her fingers to wipe away the last trace of her tears. Then she walked to her desk and rang a small metal bell. Turning to face the window, she fixed her gaze on something outside. Over her shoulders, 
Ajax could see nothing but the darkening sky. He was about to resume the conversation when he heard footsteps approaching along the corridor. The door opened, and only then did Hildegard turn. Tell the sisters not to wait, she told whoever was in the doorway. I'll be along as soon as I can. The door closed. The footsteps receded. The elderly nun remained by the window, her face impassive. Mother Hildegard, the circumstances of the balloon's crash are unexplained, Ajax began. The pilot was very experienced. The flight was one he'd done many times before. The balloon itself was subjected to regular safety checks. The conditions were good. This crash should not have happened. Her face had softened fractionally. How can I help? Something happened during the flight. We can't rule out the possibility that the accident was caused by the actions of one or more of the passengers. Deep frown lines broke the smoothness of the nun's forehead. Do you have any reason to believe Sister Maria Magdalena was troubled at all? Did you notice anything unusual about her behaviour in recent weeks? The nun's face remained steady. You suspect our sister of causing the accident? Ajax quickly shook his head. I have no reason whatsoever to do that. I will be asking the same questions of all the families involved. The nun's eyes left Ajax and fixed on the ceiling. Her behaviour was the same as normal, she said. I don't remember anything unusual or remarkable. If anything, there was an extra, I don't know, vigour about her. We'd planned a small celebration for her fortieth birthday. Her sister was coming to visit. That always made her happy. She didn't know about the balloon trip, although the rest of us did. It was to be a surprise. All the sisters were excited on her behalf. She sighed. Our mission here is to dispel earthly wants and considerations. I guess we can only ever suppress them. Was Sister Maria Magdalena happy here? Hildegard fixed him with a look. She was a bride of Christ. We believe there is no higher calling for a woman. Ajax stood. Can I see a room? From the expression on Hildegard's face, you'd think he'd asked to see her underwear. Her room? Yes, her private space. The place she kept her stuff. We have no stuff, Superintendent. We eschew personal possessions when we commit to a religious life. And we don't have rooms of our own. The cells where the sisters sleep are rotated, so that no one gets attached to any particular space. Then I'd like to see the cell where she slept last night. I can't permit that. Ajax told himself this was an elderly lady who knew nothing of the world and who just received bad news. On the other hand, he'd had one pig of a day. Mother Hildegard, this is the beginning of what could become a very serious police investigation, and I am more than capable of coming back with a warrant. It's up to you. There was a flash of fury in the nun's face. Then she suppressed it. Wait for me outside, she told him. In the corridor, Ajax and Mojo looked at each other. Didn't seem too bothered about Mary Magdalena's death, Mojo said. Did you notice that? I did. The door opened, and Mother Hildegard slipped out. Without a word, she set off along the corridor, away from the stairs. They followed, and as the smell of dinner gave way to that of incense, Ajax realised they were approaching the chapel. He felt Mojo's finger in his ribs. Mother, I'm sorry to be blunt, he said, but I couldn't help noticing you seemed more upset by Jessica's death than by her sister's. 
the nun paused. Did I give that impression? I'm sorry. All deaths are equally to be mourned. And celebrated, because the ones we have lost are with the Lord. She set off again. She's fucking with you, mumbled Mojo. How long was Maria with you? Hildegard slowed her pace, allowing Ajax to catch up. Sister Maria Magdalena joined us at the age of eighteen. We don't normally accept young women until they are twenty-one. The life of the Bride of Christ is arduous and not for everyone. But the Mother Superior at the time felt her vocation was strong, and so, against the advice of several of the senior sisters, she was admitted. Twenty-two years, said Ajax. You can't say she didn't steer the course. They'd reached the end of the corridor. In the wall ahead was a grilled window. The sound of the sisters singing came through it. Hildegard paused, allowing Ajax to look down. The chapel below had huge, arched, stained-glass windows in three of the walls. The floor was checkered with black-and-white tiles, and three rows of pews ran down each long side, facing inwards. The fading light outside cast coloured shadows around the room, and candles danced in some invisible breeze. The sisters, around four dozen, in the pews closest to the altar, sang in Latin without accompaniment. It's beautiful, said Ajax. You're very lucky to hear this every day, the nun said. To be frank with you, I was against Sister Maria Magdalena joining the order. I argued that she was very young for so great a commitment. The truth was I doubted her vocation. When did she convince you? The nun's eyes became cold again, before she turned and led them up another narrower staircase. Ajax had to duck his head at the top. They were in the roof. Narrow doors lined the corridor on each side. The smell of undiluted femininity was stronger here. Laundry and unwashed bodies. The sweet, musty smell of female lavatories. They followed Hildegard to the middle of the corridor, where she pushed open a door and allowed them to go inside. The room beyond, not called a cell without reason, thought Ajax, measured ten feet by seven, which made it almost exactly the dimensions of the cells back at the station. The only furnishings were a narrow metal bed and a wood cupboard beside it. The back wall followed the slope of the roof, and the window looked out in the direction of the sea. Above the bed hung a wooden cross. "'We lead simple lives,' said the nun, and it sounded like a boast. "'No personal possessions at all. "'Family photographs are permitted, but not displayed. "'I believe you will find a photograph of Sister and Jessica in the drawer.' Taking that as permission, Ajax crossed the room and pulled open the top drawer of the small wooden cabinet. In it he found a box of value tissues, a toiletry bag, sanitary towels, a rosary, and a framed photograph of two girls. He carried the photograph to the light, feeling Mojo pushing up behind him. Maria Magdalena, the older of the two sisters, couldn't have been more than seventeen in the picture. Her face still had the plump, uncreased gleam of the very young. Her dark hair shone and curled down past her shoulders. Her eyes were brown. Jessica was a little younger, a little fairer, very slightly less pretty. Only slightly. The two were exceptionally alike. They were beautiful, said Ajax feeling a stab of guilt at remembering that Jessica officially wasn't dead. The nun didn't pick up on it. 
Another reason why I felt Maria Magdalena was unsuited to convent life. Her face, even when she was veiled, had a way of drawing the eye. Nuns practice modesty at all times. In the old days, a beautiful nun would have had her face scarred to discourage vanity. I wouldn't advocate that, of course. What was her name? Before she became Maria Magdalena. Do you remember? The nun's face said that she forgot very little, if anything. Her name was Isabel. Isabel Lane? No, uh, Jessica was married, briefly. She brought wedding photographs to show us years ago. She never told us she was divorced. We guessed. So Isabel was... Isabel Jones. And it's possible Jessica was known as Jones, too, in the police force, although I'm not certain about that. Ajax stared. Jessica is a police officer. The nun looked amused. I assumed you knew. We only have the balloon company's paperwork to go on. It lists home address and next of kin, not occupation. Do you know where? What force? I'm afraid I don't. Not locally, I think, because she had to travel to get here. The address we have for her is in York. Ajax nodded. Someone from North Yorkshire Police would be on their way to Jessica Lane's home, to break the news to anyone they found there. She'd listed her next of kin as Sister Maria Magdalena. I really must go, Superintendent. I want to pray for the souls of our dear sisters. Of course, you are welcome to join us. Thank you, but I'll be working for a few more hours yet. May I keep hold of this photograph, just for a short while? I'll see you get it back. After Hildegard had nodded her permission, he allowed her to lead them out of the room, along the corridor, down the stairs to the ground floor. Winifred will unlock the gates for you. Is it too soon to ask what will happen to Sister Maria Magdalena's remains? We have a small cemetery here. I'm not sure she had any family other than Jessica. He'd nearly forgotten the main reason for coming here. They'll be released to her next of kin as soon as possible. In the event of no family members coming forward... The coroner is likely to conclude that that is the convent. There is one thing I do have to ask you, though, Mother. It's a difficult task, but a necessary one. You want me to identify the body? Well, it doesn't have to be you. She sighed. Of course it has to be me. Tonight? Tomorrow will be fine. I'll pick you up and drive you to the mortuary. Thank you. Was she very badly? Her face was a little damaged, but she should still be the woman you knew. And Jessica? You'll keep looking? Of course. Let's hope you won't have to mourn them both. Chapter 34 A serving police officer? Interesting. Aren't you going to be late, sir? said Ajax. The chief glanced down at his dinner jacket and starched white dress shirt, as though he'd forgotten what he was wearing. I'll only miss the prawn cocktail. Do we know which force? Not yet, Ajax said, although my guess would be North Yorkshire, given that she lived in York. Not so, sir, Chapman spoke up. I've heard back from North York's. She wasn't one of theirs. They did send someone round to her address, but there was no one there. They spoke to one of the neighbours, who said she thought they were away for a few days. They? Elaine lives with her fiancé, a bloke called Neil Fishburne, who is a serving officer with North Yorkshire. They own the house together. He might be up here as well, I suppose, Ajax said. Although I'm surprised he hasn't come forward. He looked round. Has he? 
Stacy, who was in charge of dealing with next of kin, shook her head. The neighbour also said that Lane is away a lot, Chapman went on. She often drives off first thing Monday morning, appearing again Friday evening. Suggests to me she's attached to a force some distance away. We'd have heard by now, said the chief, if she was still alive. She's had, what, ten hours to get in touch? Same with the kid. Well, it doesn't look good, Ajax agreed. I think we have to be prepared for a couple more bodies in the morning. Chapter 35 When Patrick arrived at Newcastle General, he parked in the furthest corner of the car park, where he already knew CCTV cameras didn't reach. He'd been to this hospital many times. He bought a parking ticket and carried his bag in through reception and into the nearest public lavatory. In the cubicle, he changed into medical scrubs and tied his long hair back into a ponytail. Before leaving home, he'd scrubbed his hands clean, but he checked them again now. Medic's hands were always spotless. He hung a lanyard with hospital ID, fake but convincing enough at a glance, around his neck, and left the lavatories, carrying his hold all with him. He went via the male doctor's changing rooms, leaving the bag on a bench immediately inside the door. The evening meal was being cleaned away, and peak visiting time would start shortly. It was also shift change over time, when staffing levels temporarily slumped. He made his way up to intensive care, punched in the key code that had been texted to him earlier, and found Helen Carlton's room. He slipped inside, pulled the syringe from his pocket, and injected forty millilitres of insulin into a vein on her left wrist. As he left the room, he figured it would be roughly ten to fifteen minutes before the convulsions began, and alerted her attending medical staff. He'd be long gone by then. Chapter 36 Evening visiting hour was long over, and there were several parking spaces in the hospital car park, but Ajax took his time. He found a spot some distance from the entrance. As he made his way inside, he saw a vehicle he recognised. DC Steve Chapman was here, dealing with paperwork in the mortuary. Helen Carlton was in a room off the main ward. He didn't attempt to enter, but stood instead at the large window. She was surrounded by machinery and breathing with the aid of a respirator. Excuse me? Ajax turned to see a slim Asian nurse standing behind him. You're obviously with the police. She let her eyes drift over the uniform he was still wearing. Are you involved with the balloon crash? I'm the police officer in charge for the time being. He pulled out his warrant card and introduced himself. I don't think we've managed to contact Mrs. Carlton's family yet. Her husband was killed in the same crash. I know, it's terrible. Can you stay a minute? Our administrator would like to see you. Actually, I was about to head out. I believe it's very important. Chapter 37 Back at Castle Far, Patrick unfastened the padlocks, the one at the top of the farmhouse door, then the one at the bottom, and drew the bolts. He turned the deadlock and kept hold of the key. Moving inside the house, he stepped aside to let William and Cat, their cousin, follow him in. William had the food, Cat carried the other stuff. Once they were clear of the door, he deadlocked it again and pocketed the key taking no chances this time. The boarded windows kept the house dark, even on the sunniest days. He heard Cat's hand sliding insect-like along the wall until she found the light switch. The single bulb in the hallway flicked on and they moved towards the stairs. He had no idea when people, normal people, had last lived in the farmhouse. 
none of the family could remember that far back. Now, decades after it had been a habitable home, plaster had crumbled from the ceiling and covered everything in the house like soiled snow. Paper peeled down walls and turned to mush on the damp carpets, which were so stained and worn their original colour and pattern were indiscernible. They crunched over mice droppings, brushed their way through cobwebs, to the sound of the constant drip of a leaky tap in the kitchen, crisscrossing the bare boards of the stairs were silvery snail trails. At the front of the house, a bramble had forced its way in through the gap between door and frame. No one had pulled it up, and it had gained in strength and reach, its thorn-ridden tendrils stretching towards the stairs. Ivy had followed it, and was climbing the walls. Filthy torn curtains hung at every window, in spite of the boarding that kept out all light. As the breeze they'd brought in with them made its way through the house, the curtains began to sway, the strips of wallpaper to rustle. This house was never silent. When its human occupants settled, the others started up. Rats lived in the cavities, bats in the roof area, cockroaches and wood lice and beetles scuttled everywhere. Right on cue, Patrick and the others heard movement on the floor above. They always began scurrying about when they heard the back door open. As Cat turned to precede him up the steps, he saw her nose wrinkle. The plumbing worked okay, as far as he knew, but a house that was never cleaned or aired was always going to stink. Someone began banging on one of the unlocked upstairs doors. Here we go, muttered Cat, who of all of them hated this job the most. The three occupants of the house were all in one room, the largest of the four bedrooms, with its own adjoining shower room. He went in first, Cat following, William bringing up the rear. The oldest occupant, a woman of around thirty-five, stood in the centre of the room. The teenage brother and sister pressed themselves against the far wall. Where is she? the old woman said in heavily accented English. Where is my friend? Patrick ignored her, turning instead to watch his brother carry the food over to a tall chest of drawers in one corner. What the fuck? William made an exasperated gesture. Look at this! They've left half of it! Cat joined him. Well, what twat bought pork pies and bacon sandwiches? She asked in an undertone. You know they won't eat that stuff. William pulled a face. They'll eat it if they're hungry enough. I say we'll leave it here till they do. Shut up, Will, Patrick said. We'll take the old stuff with us. We don't need any crap today. You need to come with us to the next room, he told the woman. You first, then the others know there'll be nothing to worry about. Just an injection, a vaccine. You'll need it before you get your papers. She shook her head. Your friend was stupid, he went on. We're looking for her. If we find her before the police do, we'll bring her back and everything will be fine. If the police find her, she'll be sent home. There's nothing we can do. Now come on. Let's go next door. No one's going to hurt you. He'd learned to be polite and careful when he dealt with them. There was no point making them scared or too hostile. They only fought harder. After the first few times when things had gone wrong, there was no point denying it. The people who'd stayed in the farmhouse had been treated well. They'd been fed, kept warm and safe. After what they'd been through on the journey... The farmhouse really wasn't that bad. Warily, the woman stepped forward, allowing Cat to take her arm and lead her into the next room, the one where they kept the medical equipment and the records. He breathed an inaudible sigh of relief. He'd got quite good at keeping them calm and cooperative. Of course, they all panicked when they saw the leather straps. 
Chapter 38 Evenings in late September are short and chill, and the sky turned quickly from dove grey to charcoal. Damp seemed to sit in the air. Trees she passed shook icily droplets down. Bushes smeared her with cold. Even the mud beneath her feet seemed to cover her shoes, sucking and grasping with every step, trying to pull them off her feet. Her head was aching badly again, and the voices had resumed after she'd left the pilgrims behind, becoming increasingly grim and threatening as the day had darkened. As the light left the sky, her spectral companions took form, and out of the corner of her eye she could see dark, sloping figures keeping pace. They spoke of sorrow sometimes, but mainly of guilt. The bolder ones pressed close until she could feel their breath, hot and rank, on the back of her neck. Her fault. Everything bad that had ever happened had been her fault. Her fault that her sister had been on the balloon. Worse. Her fault that all those people had died. If not for her, they'd all be alive now. Tiny hands pulled at her hair, and she let them, welcoming the sharp pain, until she realised her hair was simply getting caught in the overhanging branches of the hedges she passed. Much of the trail from Wooler followed minor roads or farm tracks, but there came a time when she had to cross open countryside once more, and the full force of the wind hit her. When the moon was hidden, even the ground at her feet became a treacherous mass of invisible mud, rocks and puddles. There was no light to be seen, not the tiniest pinprick on the horizon that might indicate habitation. In this darkness she wouldn't see any of the shepherd's huts or rambler's shelters that she knew to be along the trail. She might pass them by, feet away. When the moon was high above her, she judged it was close to midnight. She began looking for somewhere to spend the next few hours. Chapter 39 We're off now, Ma. Snip, snip. Mary didn't turn round, didn't stop what she was doing, but Patrick knew she'd heard him. Cat and William, their arms full, walked ahead and made for the caravans. I had a call while we were in there, he went on. The police dogs picked up a trail at the crash site. She raised her head, her secateurs hovering above the dead rose. She always pruned the roses after the sun had gone down. Less stressful for them, so she said. They tracked it out of the woods. Lost it after a mile or so on the border by that footpath. The one called after that saint. The secateurs danced in front of his mother as she crossed herself. Might be nothing to do with the crash. Could have been left days ago, but we're going out again. Further along the path this time. Both directions. Will and Jez are taking the horses. Mary turned then the shriveled husk of a flower in her hand. The roses that grew in the small garden behind the house were the only flowers cultivated on the far land. Every other bloom that appeared, and in summer there were several, grew wild, but the roses were important to his mother. They were black, the only known variety of naturally occurring black rose in the world, and Mary told the story of how they grew only in Turkey, but when the far ancestors had travelled to Europe from India, they'd brought cuttings with them. Stolen, the legend had it, because the black roses were carefully guarded. For a reason that nobody understood, they'd thrived in the Scottish borders, and to this day every far bride carried them in her bouquet. From inside the farmhouse came the sound of something banging, then a moan of pain. Patrick and Mary both looked up at the barred window directly above their heads, then at each other. What happened here last night? Mary nodded towards the rear door of the farmhouse. The bolts on the outside were drawn. He shrugged. I don't fucking know, Mar. 
The dogs were kicking off. You know what they're like when there's one of them badges around. I let Shinto out. He ran off. I stood at the door trying to see what was bothering him. Mary's almost shapeless face twisted. You stood at the door. She got past you while you stood at the door. He kicked at a loose stone. I might have stepped outside for a couple of seconds. I lost sight of the blasted dog. It was over by the bottom corner. You left the door open. I was yards away, for less than a minute. How did she get out of the compound? That's what I want to know. What the fuck did she do? Climb? He looked at the fence. It was ten feet high. A tight weave mesh of sharp, strong wire. No one could climb it. I haven't had a chance to walk around in daylight, he said. There might be something, I don't know. Away underneath, a foxhole. She was a wee lass, it's possible. Mary glared at him for a second longer, then turned her back and resumed her task. It has to stop. Snip. Snip. More dead husks fell to the ground. He'd been waiting for this. We've had some bad luck. We'll get through it. It was never meant to go this far. She would never have wanted this. The name she never said any more hovered in the air between them. We can't cancel tomorrow night, he said. That's the last. She was upset. She'd calm down. He could argue later. Let's just get the crash sorted, he said. Then we can talk. Chapter 40 Without speaking, the administrator led Ajax to the locked doors of the theatre suite. Are you sure you can't tell me what this is about? he asked. She tapped in a key code. Better if Mr. Wallace tells you himself. They walked through into a wide, functional corridor. Fluorescent lights flickered overhead. Empty trolleys lined one wall. The corridor wasn't busy, but energy seemed to emanate from one room at its far end. Footsteps sounded, and Ajax turned to see two green-clad medics striding towards them. They raced past without acknowledging either him or the administrator, and burst through the crash doors into the busy room. The administrator stopped at the double doors and used an internal telephone. Ajax tried to eavesdrop, caught only, he's here. There was a rattle behind as a cleaning team arrived. The cleaners pushed past him, parked the trolley and one of them peered through the window. He shook his head. Still at it, he said to the other. Leaving the trolley, they went back the way they'd come. The big swing doors crashed open, and two more medics strode out. Ajax hadn't got a look at the pair who'd just entered, but he didn't think these could be the same. These two were covered in blood. Both carried large white bags, solid and rectangular in construction, like picnic cold bags, except that these had Human Organ for Transplant in bright red letters on the side. They strode off down the corridor. The doors pushed open again. The man who stepped through this time was tall and very thin, possibly in late middle age, but the lower half of his face was covered by a surgical mask and his hair concealed beneath a cap. His scrubs were drenched in blood. So were his gloves, mask and cap. Ajax resisted the temptation to back away. The doctor stood in the doorway, looking around, as though not really sure why he was there. Then his eyes fixed on the administrator. He inclined his head and strode across the corridor to a side room, gesturing that they follow him. Once they'd all entered the small, white-painted storage room, the door slammed behind them. The surgeon had his back to them, was pulling off his mask, then his gloves. He dropped them into a surgical waste bin, 
and then froze, breathing heavily. His hands, clean and pale without the gloves, were clenched into fists. Ajax raised his eyebrows at the administrator. She pursed her lips, her eyes flicking from one man to the next. Getting no answer there, Ajax looked round the room, bitterly missing Mojo in the sheer absurdity of it all. But she never came into hospitals. Superintendent Maldonado. Ajax turned back. That's me. The surgeon looked down at his blood-covered clothes. You probably won't want to shake hands. Good call, Ajax said. What's this about? I'm Ralph Wallace. You've already met Susan Hammond, our hospital administrator. She's here because if you agree to what I'm about to ask, there'll be paperwork to sort out urgently. I'm in the middle of a procedure, and I have to get back to it right away. I shouldn't have left. What's so important you're risking a patient's life? The patient is dead. We're carrying out a complete organ transplant on a young woman who died of serious head injuries in a climbing fall earlier today. Liver, kidneys, heart, lungs, corneas, everything it's possible to remove. She was young and very healthy. She was also from the Middle East, and we get very few donors of that particular ethnicity. There are couriers on standby to take the organs to recipients throughout the North East. Ajax thought of the doctors leaving the theatre, their drawn faces, blood-stained gowns, the bags they'd carried. I never normally see people, especially people I don't know, immediately after organ harvesting— Wallace went on. I wouldn't usually dream of leaving theatre during a procedure. Today, though, it's unavoidable. Excuse me for saying so, Ajax said. But you don't look well. The man's nostrils pinched as he took a deep breath. I'm perfectly well. You had to deal with a serious incident today yourself, Superintendent. You saw terrible injuries— Quite possibly people in dreadful pain. You understand about trauma. I guess. People don't appreciate because we don't, we can't tell them how traumatic transplant surgery is. We have a very short space of time to tear a body apart and rip out everything that made it functional. Physically, it's draining, it's extremely messy, and when the person is young, it's quite heartbreaking. And we do it because it saves lives. Out of an unavoidable death, good can come, if we act quickly. It might be the sight, even the smell of all the blood, but Ajax was starting to feel light-headed. What can I do? You're the police officer in charge of the balloon crash. Ajax inclined his head. The only passenger known to have survived, Helen Carlton, was admitted shortly after eleven o'clock this morning, Wallace said. She was taken immediately into surgery. We did everything we could, and for a while we were hopeful. But she deteriorated earlier this evening. I'm afraid there's no chance of her recovery impossible to prevent the thought that it was probably for the best. Her husband and son are both dead, Ajax said. Possibly her daughter too, although we haven't found her yet. So I understand. A terrible business. I saw her a couple of minutes ago. Ajax turned to the administrator. She's still on the ward. We confirmed brain death forty minutes ago, she told him. It's only the ventilator keeping her alive. Do you need permission from next of kin to turn it off? Because I'm afraid... No. We need the permission of her next of kin to harvest her organs. I see. She carried a donor card said the administrator, as did her husband, incidentally, but it was too late by the time he arrived. 
As you know, the law requires that we get confirmation from the next of kin before proceeding, even when the deceased person has made their wishes perfectly clear. I think I see what you're getting at. But even if we do find Poppy Colton, even if she's in a fit state to give permission, she's fifteen years old. She couldn't authorise you to turn the machines off and open her mother up. You misunderstand, said Wallace. I'm asking you to find Helen Carlton's new next of kin. Sibling, parent, cousin if necessary. If we can get their permission before the night's out, any number of lives could be saved. A wave of pure exhaustion washed over Ajax. There are currently seven thousand people in the United Kingdom who are critically ill, and whose lives could either be saved or improved immeasurably by a transplant, said the surgeon. I'm aware of that. Ajax felt his jaw tightening. I have a father of three young children on my list who is suffering from severe liver disease. Without a transplant, he has less than two years to live. I already know his HLA and blood group are a close match to Helen's. He lives less than an hour away. There is every chance he could be matched and in theatre before the night is out. Silence. There was a ticking clock somewhere in the room. The surgeon swayed and put a hand out to steady himself. I'll see what I can do, said Ajax. Chapter 41 she drew closer to the tiny light, listening carefully. It would be a farm, and isolated farms had dogs. Usually chained, but not always. On the other hand, shelter of any sort would be better than spending the night in the open. Closer up, the farmhouse looked large, with four windows facing the front on the upper storey, and a double front door opening onto a small railed garden. She could see lights in two of the upper windows. A grass verge rang alongside the farm track. She kept to it, close to the hedge, knowing the chances of being seen even by someone looking out of the window were slim. There were no more lights that she could see, and the wind was masking most of the sound she was making. When she reached the small semicircle of gravel in front of the house, she stopped. Two cars were parked outside. There was no shelter from the wind here. It raced around the chimneys, sliding down the pitched roof, buffeting the trees that circled the farm. Against the dark night sky she could see them bending and swaying, almost as though reaching down towards her. The farm buildings were all around the rear of the house, and she had to tread on gravel to get there. Sudden movement in the field made her jump but it was only a spooked horse, cantering away. An empty stable would be ideal. She could bury herself in straw. Farm vehicles, a Land Rover, a tractor, a pull-along plough, were parked at the side of the house, and beyond them she could see the enormous outline of a hay barn. It was open on four sides, only the roof offering protection from the elements, but the hay bales would screen her. She moved on, feeling specks of rain on her head again. The hay inside the barn was piled high, a dozen bales or more in the highest point of the stack, but those lower down had formed a crude stairway to allow the farmer to access the ones at the top. She went up, sensing instinctively that being off the ground would make her feel safer, until she reached a hollow in between two larger stacks. Surprised at how heavy hay bales were, she managed to move two more and jump into the hole they'd left behind. All around her now was thick packed hay. Above, the roof of the barn kept the rain away. She wasn't going to die tonight. Not of exposure, anyway. Chapter 42 Here, Jax! I'm in my dressing gown. You can't come now. People will talk. Ajax overtook a lorry and pulled into the inside lane. 
The road was busy even at this hour, and this wasn't going to be an easy drive. He had to smile, though, at the picture of the elderly West Indian lady feigning modesty about her dressing gown. It was bright purple, quilted with gold buttons. He'd seen her walk to the corner shop in it before now, and God help anyone who dared stare or laugh. I'm sorry, Teresa. I should have called before, he said. My nice quiet day didn't quite turn out as I'd planned. He heard the sound of a yawn being stifled. Then, Have you been dealing with that balloon crash? she asked. I was watching it under news. Them pa folk. God bless their souls. I'm going to try and make it tomorrow, Teresa. But if I don't, it's not because I don't want to, it's because... You work too hard. Where are you now, hmm? You're not at home, are you? I can hear traffic. He stepped on the brake to avoid a car approaching down the slip road. No, I've got something to do. Shouldn't take me long, he lied. Come round anyway. Let those fools say what they like. I'll leave a key under the mat. You can sleep in Clark's old bed and I'll cook you a nice West Indian breakfast, hmm? How about that? He smiled at the thought of pork steaks with glazed pineapple, of spicy sweet potato chips. My feet stick out six inches from the bottom of Clark's bed, and if you leave a key under your doormat in that part of town, you'll be murdered in your sleep. Ha! Huh. No one dare mess with me. What with you and Clark, I've got the best protection on the estate. I'm like the godmother. Clark, Teresa's son, and Ajax's best mate from school, had spent roughly half his adult life in prison. He had contacts Ajax didn't want to think about. Go to bed, lovely lady. I'll call you in the morning. He ended the call and pulled out into the fast lane. Chapter 43 She woke with a start. She'd been dreaming of eyes staring down at her, of hot breath on her face. The cloud cover must have passed, releasing the moon from its grip, because she could see the dark shadow of the barn roof, the crinkled texture of the hay, the dotted stars too far away to come to her aid, and the enormous German shepherd dog less than a foot from her face. She knew this dog. His dog had found her. He'd be seconds behind. Shinto! His voice, deep and sore, his accent a peculiar mix of Scottish borders and something foreign. He was in the barn, looking for the dog. The dog dropped both front paws into the hollow that had been her nest. Distracted momentarily by a scent that wasn't hers, it dug its nose into a corner. Shinto! Get back here. Footsteps and low murmurs of conversation sounded from below. He wasn't alone. The dog raised its head, and she caught a glimpse of fang-like teeth in its open mouth. They wouldn't let a dog kill her, surely. The crash survivors had been killed quickly, with blows to the head, a sharp upward twist of the neck. They wouldn't be so cruel as to leave her to a vicious dog. A dog couldn't be tried for murder. Giving up on the rat or whatever had saved her so far, the dog slunk back towards her, its brown eyes gleaming. She couldn't help the whimper slipping out as its head hung above her face and a droplet of saliva fell onto her cheek. She could hear a steady, thumping rhythm that could only be her own heartbeat. Shinto! Another angry call from below. The thumping grew faster, but she could place it now. Not her heartbeat, after all. The dog's tail was banging against the hay. Remembering that Shinto had allowed the toffee lady to pet him, she reached out. Good dog. The whisper melted into the hay as the dog pressed its head into her hand. She scratched behind one ear. Shinto pawed at her to carry on. Then he stiffened and sprang. His claws dug into her flesh before he leapt from the hollow, just as she heard the frantic barking of another dog. Shouting below. Several dogs barking, 
running, torch beams on the barn roof, then a hideous din of snarling and growling. There was a dogfight taking place beneath her in the barn. She pressed tight into her hiding place, as the voice she recognised yelled at his dog. Other men swore and shouted. A male voice, louder than the others, demanded to know what the hell was going on, did they have any idea of the bloody time, and he'd have the law on them. The noise of the fight subsided. She pictured the two animals, still snarling, being held by their collars as their claws scrambled on the barn floor. Get him away. Chain him up. And shut the others up. The barking faded. What do you want for? The man hunting her spoke. Looking for someone. A kid. Had a row with her mam and dad. Run off. What makes you think she's here? She was seen in Woola, heading out along the Pilgrim's Trail. We're checking all the places just off it. We've seen nothing. There was enmity between the two men, and fear also. The owner of the farm was afraid of the man looking for her. A man called Far. Then you won't mind if we have a look around. A kid wouldn't come here. A kid would head for the city. You're wasting your time. Maybe, but it's my time to waste. She pictured them below, far with his hand on Shinto, the farmer squaring up to him, scared but not wanting to lose face. Are the police looking for her? The farmer said. We don't bother the police, we look after our own. A different voice this time, similar to Far's, same accent. Five minutes. Then I want you off my property. Silence for several long seconds. Then the sound of someone turning around and walking away, calling to someone. Pat, we're done, said a voice below. There's no one here. Yeah, a third voice. That was a false alarm. They're both dead. We've looked everywhere they could have gone. Oh, give me a minute. I've just... I don't know. A feeling. His voice again. His name was Pat. Patrick? Patrick Farr. Mar wants us home. And you got those phones to deal with just now. Three distinct voices all with the same not-quite-Scottish accent, similar in pitch and cadence, three close relatives. She could almost hear his sigh of frustration. Okay. Quick look round, then we're out of here. Off you go, buddy. She heard the scramble of paws as the dog was released again. They'd watch it this time, see it come bounding up the bales towards her. She saw a beam dance around the barn roof, felt the hay move as someone heavy began climbing the stack. A large masculine hand appeared over the edge of the hollow. He was a split second from seeing her. The hand moved closer, until it was inches away. A left hand. She could see dark hairs, the edge of the jacket sleeve, and an odd bracelet, strands of plaited black hair held together by a carved silver clasp. Then the stack shifted beneath her. She heard a muttered curse as the hand disappeared. He'd fallen. She heard the sound of someone heavy landing on the barn floor. Then footsteps. She lay, not daring to move, listening to voices fading and then finally the sound of a vehicle starting. It felt like a very long time before she was able to sleep again. Chapter 44 Six Years Earlier The sisters sat in the chapel of Winding Priory. It was empty, but for them, and cold, because the heating was only ever used during services. Isabel had found them cloaks, and they were both wrapped head to foot in black wool. It was dark, too, because Isabel hadn't thought or wanted to turn on the lights. 
From a distance the two shrouded women might be indistinguishable. Two nuns talking in chapel about religious doctrine or the wonder of a life in Christ. Jessica couldn't imagine anything more vile than what she'd just heard. A short distance away across the tiled floor was the elaborately carved confessional, where the nuns knelt and confessed their sins before God and the visiting priest. How very appropriate. Why didn't you tell me before? she said. Are you better or happier for knowing? asked Isabel. Of course not. Well, that's why I didn't tell you. All the same, I had a right to know. Isabel sighed. You were too young when it happened. For a long time you were too young. I couldn't burden you with it. Auntie Brenda? Uncle Rob, they knew? Isabel inclined her head. Later on, when you probably were old enough, I asked myself what the point was. He's been out of our lives for so long now, and you're a grown woman. He's no danger to you. Jessica reached out, fumbled beneath black wool, and found her sister's hand. I don't get it, she said. Why didn't Dad do something? Or was it after he... Isabel sighed. Oh, to be honest, Jess, I'm a bit confused about the timing of everything myself. There are big chunks of that time that I can't remember at all. But no, I think he'd already gone into the army when Dad... Well, when he died. Jessica pulled away, sitting upright on the hard wooden seat. Dad knew, she said. He sent him away to protect us. And then he couldn't live with himself, with losing Mum, with, with what Ned had done. Jess, calm down. Isabel reached out a pale, cold hand. We can't know what was going on in Dad's head. We'll never know what drove him to do what he did. I know, Jessica said. I don't care what you say. I know. She took a deep breath to steady her head, and then took hold of her sister's hand again. And this is why you've been hiding away all these years? A moment's pause, then. That's an ungenerous interpretation of my calling, Jessica. You were the strongest person I knew. There was nothing you couldn't do, and now... She stopped. And now? Prompted Isabel. Well, now you... you do nothing. You were a child, Jess. Admit the possibility that your memory is flawed, and that I never was the person you've created in your head. Besides, Mother Hildegard tells us regularly that we are the strongest women of all. When we're breaking the ice on water in order to wash our faces on winter mornings, or when we're carrying home firewood from the far corners of the grounds, I'm inclined to think she has a point. Jessica realised she was squeezing Isabel's hand, she had to stop. She would hurt her sister, who'd already dealt with so much. We should find him, she said. He shouldn't get away with it. He'll answer to God, Jess, Isabel said, her voice flat and hard. At least that's what we tell ourselves every day, that sinners will answer to God. Do you believe that? No answer. I still want to find him, Jessica said. I want him to answer to me, and the law. Isabel got to her feet. There speaks the policewoman. The nun's duty is to forgive. I've spent years learning that lesson. She walked forward towards the chancel rail. When she reached it, she sank to her knees and let her head drop into her hands. Jessica stood too. Her high heels clicked on the tiles as she approached Isabel's kneeling figure. Maybe he's sorry, she said to the back of her sister's veil. Maybe he wants to make it up to you. No reaction at all. Blood is thicker, Isabel. Her sister's face shot round. 
Don't you patronise me, Jess. It didn't happen to you. You don't get to tell me how to deal with it. Isabel got to her feet. You can track him down if you want to, she told a stunned Jessica. I can't and I won't stop you. But don't imagine for a moment that you can be some sort of peace envoy, brokering a reconciliation between the two of us. I will never see him or speak to him or hear of him again. And if you try to force him on me, I will never see you again. Chapter 45 Thursday the 21st of September Patrick got back to Castle Far at three in the morning. The fire directly outside his mother's caravan had been stoked until the flames were leaping four feet into the air. As he drew nearer, his lungs clenched in his chest, reacting to the smoke of the fire, the cigarettes, the joints. The adult members of his family sat in a wide circle around the flames. Some of the seats were the cheap fold-up kind, of hollow metal and plastic. Some were taken from car interiors. Some were car tyres balanced one on top of the other. There were no empty seats. No one offered to fetch him one. A drop two between the pylons and the river, he said. One in a bog near one of the bodies. The rest among the trees where it came down. They'll find them come daylight. Kick themselves for missing them yesterday. Sneaking around the perimeter of the crash scene, placing all the mobile phones he'd stolen from the dead and dying passengers, had been his last chore of a very long day. When they were found, the police would assume they'd been in passengers' hands, natural enough, and dropped when the balloon came down. "'And Jimmy is sure they're clean?' Mary asked. She had the distrust of technology that comes of being older and a traveller to boot. Fifteen-year-old Jimmy had a talent for technology. Since he'd arrived home from school, he'd been using his own computer to hack into each of the passengers' phones, looking for evidence of text messages sent during the final few minutes, or photographs of Patrick. Two of the phones had grainy, indistinct pictures, but they'd been wiped. The teenage boy had sent tweets and one text message, but hadn't specified how the accident had happened. As clean as they can be. Jimmy's dad had his fag clutched between forefinger and thumb, the lit end tucked away in his palm to protect it from the wind. The traces are still there if anyone digs deep enough. We just have to hope they don't. We've still only cleaned eight, though, said Mary. The pilots makes nine. Thirteen people in that balloon. There could be four more out there. Not everyone has a phone, Ma, said Charles. How did you get on? Patrick asked his brother. Charles and William had been tasked with getting rid of the pilot's body. Forty feet down in Hose Law Lock, said Charles. Spent two hours cleaning Mam's car. So we're good? No, we're not good, snapped Mary. There's still two passengers not found. We'll find them in the morning, Patrick said. They had a helicopter over earlier tonight. Spotted two hot spots that they're pretty certain are bodies. They're going out first light to bring them in. They're dead, Mar. If they're not, we'll have found them by now. This time tomorrow it'll all be over. It had better be. His mother got up, dropped her cigarette and stamped it out. She turned without another word and walked to her caravan. Taking that as a signal that the day finally was over, the others got up too. Some said good night, some simply walked away, until Patrick was alone by the fire. Chapter 46 It wasn't far off dawn when Ajax got home. He went straight upstairs, took off his clothes on the landing and crept naked into bed. It was warm, sweet-scented. Felt like bliss. Mojo turned and wrapped her body around his with a soft, sleepy grunt. Any luck? 
she mumbled into his left shoulder. He lay staring at the ceiling, knowing he had to be up again in two hours. I found her parents in Yom. Drove them up to give them a chance to say goodbye, and handed them over to a family liaison officer. Helen Carlton is being stripped of all spare parts as we speak. Mojo stretched up and kissed his ear. It was the right thing to do. Will it count in my favour, do you think? On judgment, D. Oh, I should think so. Why a helicopter with heat-seeking equipment go over after dark? Boss's orders. They found a couple of sites of interest. We'll go straight to them in the morning. Touch wood. We'll find Jessica Lane, Poppy Carlton and the pilot. And we can hand the whole scene over to the crash investigators. You should sleep now, she said. I'll never sleep, baby. You know that. She ran her hand across his chest. Then think about something nice. Chapter 47 Six Years Earlier The blues and twos were directly behind now, and he could no longer pretend they were chasing someone else. Ajax pulled over, turned off the engine and got out. The traffic cop coming towards him was small and thin. Another, bigger bloke, the driver, remained in the police vehicle. Then the copper heading his way stepped into the light of a street lamp and he did a quick reappraisal. Tall for a woman, slim but strong. She looked like an athlete, a rower or a swimmer, broad in the shoulder but with long, slim legs. Her black trousers fitted perfectly. Regulation kit didn't often look like high fashion, but on this woman, oh yes. Step away from the car, please, sir. She was several feet away, walking deliberately, not rushing. Her dark hair was fastened at the back of her neck in a bun. She could have been a model, posing as a police officer in a glossy magazine. What's the problem, officer? Are you aware this is a thirty-mile-an-hour zone, sir? Ajax made a point of looking round at the wide road that would take three cars abreast with ease at the large houses set back behind long front gardens. No one parked on the street here. No one needed to. The road was entirely clear. Can't see any signs, he said. I think you'll find there was one a quarter of a mile back. She pulled out a notebook and looked at his registration number. And the default speed limit on roads with lampposts is thirty miles an hour. We clocked you doing thirty-seven miles an hour along a three-hundred-metre stretch. Uh, keep your hands where I can see them, sir. Ajax had been reaching for his inside jacket pocket. Ignoring her, he pulled out his warrant card, but kept it tucked away in his hand. She saw it, though, and her jaw tightened as she stepped up to him. He noticed her eyebrows, thick and black, and her dark almond-shaped eyes, her lips were wide and plump, her chin pointed and cleft. In the lamplight her skin looked as white as paper. "'What's your name, love?' he asked. She told him, making it sound like an insult as she pulled out a warrant card. He bent closer to look at it. "'Do people call you Mojo?' he asked. "'Not if they're wise.' Mine's Detective Chief Inspector Ajax Maldonado. He held out his own warrant card. The second officer, who'd heard the entire exchange through an open car window, dropped his eyes. The PC looked at her feet. Sorry, sir. I didn't know. Ajax felt a stab of disappointment at her sudden capitulation. No problem, love. We all make mistakes. He turned to get back into his car. You have a nice night. Ajax. She put out a hand to hold the car door in place. Like the cleaning fluid. He put his own hand on top of hers. He'd planned to lift hers away from the car, 
but kept both in place for a second. Like the legendary Greek hero, he winked at her. She gave him a speeding ticket. They were married six months later. Chapter 48 Thursday the 21st of September She woke before the sun appeared, but even so the farm beat her to it. She could hear the lowing of cows in the milking shed, the scrabble and bark of dogs, the steady grind of machinery. Her body had stiffened overnight. She rolled onto her back, pushing her legs out from the coffin-shaped nest. She raised her head and saw that the hay barn was empty but for her. Painfully slowly she climbed down the bale mountain. The farmyard was still in darkness, with only slender beams of light stealing out from the house and the milking shed. Her headache was better. Still there, but less intense. No longer pounding. She had a feeling she wouldn't be hearing the voices today, and that felt right. For a time yesterday she'd walked with dead people, but had a sense of leaving them behind now. She could smell the milk as she slipped from one shadow to the next. She'd eaten nothing yesterday except for the pack of Reese's peanut butter cups and sweets the two lady pilgrims had offered her. There was a village, though, a short detour off the trail before it headed north towards Holy Island. There was money in her rucksack. She could eat. Today, she could face the living again. Today, she could be with people she loved, start to grieve properly. Today would take her home. Chapter 49 Overnight, the autumn had turned cold. A chill wind was driving in from the west, and the sky was a colour of wallpaper paste. The cloud formation, lumpy, heavy, looked to have something of its texture. The absence of sunlight muted the colours of the National Park. Everywhere Ajax looked he saw dull browns, mud, the colours of a dying world. The damp seeped through his uniform until he felt as though it was corroding his bones. He was standing beneath a large beech tree, some thirty metres from the spot where the balloon had eventually come down. A police climber had minutes earlier disappeared into the leaves. Close to the trunk, another member of the line access team, the specialist police unit brought in when climbing was called for, relayed rope up to his colleague. A few hundred metres away, another team with dry suits were searching a moorland bog. Every time someone jumped or fell out, the balloon would have shot up again, said the line access officer. That guy Richard was explaining to me yesterday. The ones left in and must have been thinking it was never going to stop. It wasn't long after seven in the morning, but their attempts to get the grim job done without an audience had failed. Already a small crowd had gathered at the site's perimeter. Media people mainly, but a few sightseers too, the sort of people who slowed down on motorways as they passed fatal traffic accidents. Ajax knew some of the men and women in the crowd. A journalist from the local BBC news station, the lead reporter from the Newcastle Times. He'd spotted Richard Allen from the balloon company and several people in brightly coloured hiking clothes. Also a dark-haired man in a trilby. I think I've got something. The voice buzzed through the radio, and Ajax stepped closer. He shared a look with the man on the ground. What is it, Paul? said the line access officer. Hold on. The crackled reply told them nothing. Ajax moved round the tree, trying to get a better angle. Is there someone up there? His neck was beginning to ache. The climber's mate held up a finger to silence him. The radio crackled again. I'm looking at the body of one juvenile female. E.G said a soft voice behind him. Ajax rubbed his face. The adrenaline that had carried him through a sleepless night was running dangerously low. E.G., repeated Mojo. The grandparents are here. 
Ajax looked back to the waiting crowd. He hadn't registered them properly the first time he'd looked. A quiet, unassuming couple in their seventies, who in the past twenty-four hours had lost almost everything, and who had still allowed themselves to be dragged from their bed without complaint and driven forty miles north to give permission for their daughter's corpse to be cut apart. Now they were about to hear that almost everything had been hopelessly optimistic. The last blow was about to fall. Telling the line access team to hold off for a few minutes, to get everything ready but delay bringing the body down, Ajax set off towards the waiting crowd. The grandparents were close to the man with the dark hair and the trilby. Eileen, Tom, come with me. Ajax beckoned them away from the others. We'll find somewhere for you to sit down. They came with him willingly enough. Eileen tottered over the grass in unsuitable shoes, but couldn't hold her nerve until they were out of earshot of the media. Is there any news? Have they found Poppy? Her question sparked an immediate flurry of activity. Are these the grandparents? Are you still hoping to find Poppy Carlton alive? Ajax, is it true someone survived? That you got people out looking for her? Keeping one arm around Eileen's shoulders, Ajax turned back. Press conference at ten, guys. Is this it? asked Tom, the grandfather. Is this where the balloon came down? I can't see anything. It came to rest about thirty metres that way. Ajax pointed. The balloon no longer draped the nearby trees like blown away laundry. It had been retrieved late yesterday and taken away, along with the basket for examination. We found Helen and Harry there. And Nathan. Stacy had seen Ajax beckoning and was hurrying over. I'm going to leave you with Constable McElvoy now, he said. I have to get back to Newcastle for a press conference. Stacy will take you to a car where you can sit down. He glanced over to where the team at the tree had ignored him. They were sending up more ropes. They had a stretcher, the sort that is attached to a body bag. He put his body in between the grandparents and what was happening at the tree. Just until we have more news, he said. Chapter 50 Patrick stayed until he knew for certain that the body lowered from the tree was the only one the police had found. He listened to the rumours, buzzing around the onlookers that it had been the body of a child. He watched the body bag being loaded into a mortuary van and driven away. Then he watched the police team start to move out. There was nothing else here. The team in the nearby bog were continuing their search, but he knew there was no way she could have ended up in it. He'd seen the last few minutes of the balloon in the air. It hadn't gone anywhere near the bog. Against all odds, one woman had walked away from the crash. Somewhere out there, she was still walking. Chapter 51 Sir, I need a word. Steve Chapman had practically leapt into the corridor in front of Ajax, making him wonder not for the first time if glass-walled offices were entirely a good idea. I'm on my way to the boss, Ajax told him. He wants a word too, and that usually means I'm in trouble. And the press conference starts in ten. Chapman wasn't taking no for an answer this morning. Thing is, sir, when I was in Newcastle General last night, I was asked to take a report of a fatal accident, and I think it needs looking into. The door at the end of the corridor opened, and the chief appeared, looking pointedly at his watch. Got collared, sir, Ajax said as they drew closer. Chappers here thinks we don't have enough work on at the moment. Is it quick, Steve? the chief asked. He ushered them both into his office. The force's medical adviser, a reed thin bloke called Standish, was sitting at the conference table, nervously fiddling with a pen. A young woman was brought into A&E midday yesterday. Chapman leapt straight into it. 
as though afraid the chief might change his mind. In a bad way. Uh, morning, Dr. Standish. Name of Tarmina Farrah. She'd been walking on the cliff path near Howick and fell onto the rocks. Bad head injuries. Died shortly after arrival. He stopped for breath. We're listening, Ajax encouraged, although the look on the chief's face suggested that might not be the case for long. She carried a donor card and the relatives gave permission, so she was taken into theatre. Newcastle have a very experienced organ surgeon. It was a bit of a lucky day for them, if you see what I mean. Standish's eyebrows rose. I was there, Ajax said. I talked to him last night. Walker, Wallace, he was in the middle of a transplant procedure. Wallace, Chapman agreed. I haven't spoken to him, but a couple of the junior doctors, an anaesthetist and a registrar, weren't happy. When they heard I was in the building, they asked to see me. In what way unhappy? Ajax asked. It didn't feel right to them that she had such severe head injuries, but no damage to the rest of her body, apart from a few scratches and bruises. If she'd fallen any significant distance, they'd expect cracked ribs, broken limbs, fractured wrists, extensive lacerations. Well, none of that. They wanted to convey their concerns to the coroner, but Wallace was the doctor in charge, and he disagreed. Anything to add, Paul? the chief asked the medical adviser. These things are always open to interpretation, Standish said. Presumably there'll be a post-mortem, if there's anything dodgy going on. Yeah, but the really worrying thing is her two relatives, a couple of blokes, can't be contacted, Chapman said. The numbers they gave aren't responding. A moment's silence, while the chief and Standish frowned at each other. Open up a file, said Ajax, although you've probably done that already, and uh, get someone down to the hospital to take statements. Check CCTV, make sure the post-mortem is marked urgent. You may need to find someone else to take it forward, though, chappers. I need you on the balloon inquiry for now. Nodding his thanks, the constable left the room. We probably should go downstairs, Ajax said. Oh, morning, Paul. How you doing? They'll wait five minutes, the chief said. I've been hearing about your midnight race to Yarman back. Ajax said nothing. Well? With respect, sir, that wasn't a question. The boss gave an exaggerated sigh. We have a very busy week. We would have had a busy week even without this balloon business. You, in particular, will be very thinly stretched, and yet you choose to sacrifice a night's sleep at the random request of a member of the medical profession, whom you don't even know. Have I got something wrong so far? No, you pretty much bang on. Paul Standish stood up. Do you want me to wait outside? Perhaps that would be... the chief began. No, Ajax interrupted. You're bloody lucky Helen Carlton's parents didn't put in a complaint about insensitive behaviour, the chief said, as if they haven't been through enough. Ralph Wallace called me first thing this morning, Ajax said. He thinks seven lives will have been saved, or immeasurably improved, as a result of Eileen and Tom agreeing to release their daughter's body. Oh, I don't doubt it. The boss moved to the corner of the room and pulled his jacket from a hanger. Look, Ajax, I know this sort of thing is always going to be an issue for you, but personal crusades have no place in the police service. I was only trying to help. And again, with respect, we have three minutes. Yeah. That's why Paul's here. Sit down a minute. Ajax sat. I'm not sure about this press conference, Ajax, the chief said. I've been talking to Paul about the likelihood of Jessica Lane and Sean Allen surviving the crash and what sort of state they might be in. Tell him what you've just told me, Paul. A pretty bad state, frankly. 
Given the severity of the injuries the other passengers suffered, Standish said. No one leaps out of a hot air balloon unscathed. The chances are they're still in the National Park, dead or very badly injured. Well, I don't disagree, but that's no reason to postpone the press conference, said Ajax. We've already put it off twenty-four hours. We're going to take some serious flack if we cancel now. And when they want to know what a serving police officer was doing on the flight, and why she was in Northumberland, the chief said, For God's sake, stop looking at the clock. I can tell the bloody time. Ajax sighed. We haven't released the details of Jessica Lane's profession, so I doubt it will come up. But as far as we're aware, she was visiting her sister and the balloon trip was a birthday surprise. I don't see the problem, sir. If Jessica Lane survived that crash, why hasn't she been in touch? Any police officer with anything about them would have stared at the scene, tried to administer first aid, got in touch with the emergency services. Why didn't she do any of that? Well, all good questions, sir, which suggests to me she didn't survive. Or there's more going on than we know about. Once again, Ajax thought of the spatters of brain tissue on the basket. No, he was not letting that cat out of the bag, not until he knew something for certain. Thanks for your time, Paul. I'll be in touch. The boss fastened his jacket and found his hat from the cupboard. He could make a simple action like putting on a hat convey disapproval. Ajax followed him along the corridor. He was taller than his boss by a couple of inches and heavier. His colouring, he knew, made him stand out, especially in the northeast of England. And yet the acting chief constable had a presence Ajax knew he'd never have. Even the way he walked into the press conference room, looking round before carefully removing his hat, would convey precisely the right blend of authority and courtesy. A short distance from the door... He slowed, letting Ajax catch up. Ajax, I've been meaning to talk to you about tonight, he said in a low voice, because on this floor anyone could be listening. We've had another tip-off from the lads on the coast about a possible boat of migrants coming in. Coming in tonight? Oh, apparently so. Guy on the dock has been told to clock off early and go home. His pay won't be docked. Says his boss is a tight ass bastard who wouldn't pay him for nothing unless there was something going down. And do you want me to release officers from St. James's Park? I'm asking if we can do it with no risk. Well, we can do it, and we'll almost certainly get away with it. No one really believes that warning was serious, but... He left the butt hanging. The boss glanced towards the press room where the head of communications, a stern-faced young woman in a grey suit, was waiting to usher them inside. If anything does happen and it gets out we directed officers away from the stadium to chase asylum seekers, and there'll be asylum seekers in the world's press that morning, not illegal immigrants, we're up shit creek. Beautifully put, sir. The head of communications pushed open the door and led the way inside. The boss paused in the doorway, looked round the room and took off his hat. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, he said. Thank you for coming. The room seemed to settle, to give a collective sigh of satisfaction and anticipation. The boss had that effect. Chapter 52 she used a corner of toast to wipe grease from her plate and swallowed the last mouthful of tea. She was still hungry, but having polished off the full English breakfast with all the trimmings and extra toast, she knew that to order more food now would be to draw attention to herself. There was a phone behind the counter. Maybe the café owner would let her use it if she offered to pay. The café owner had already asked an uncomfortable number of questions— about where she'd come from, was it the first time she'd walked St Cuthbert's Way, and was she hoping to get to Lindisfarne by the end of the day because it was going to be another wet one? Oh, and was she sure she was okay travelling alone because pilgrims were all very well, 
but they saw some dodgy types coming through the village, and she wouldn't want any daughter of hers walking those lonely footpaths by herself. Three mothers with toddlers had listened to every word. Maybe she'd find a public phone. Others had come into the cafe. A foreign-looking truck driver. An elderly man who'd rarely looked up from his newspaper. The owner's attention had been forced away, and she'd taken her food to the furthest table from the counter. Turn it up, Madge. High on the wall in the corner of the room, a television set had been playing quietly, tuned to the BBC News Channel. A woman in a blue coat with a flawless face and perfect hair was standing in front of a copse of beech trees, talking about how the trip of a lifetime had turned into a journey from hell for thirteen very unlucky people. At least ten people died when the balloon came down, and the death toll may rise higher yet. The reporter's hair was being blown around her face, and every few seconds she had to brush it out of her eyes or mouth. Police have so far not confirmed that an eleventh body has been found this morning, but the signs are increasing that no one came out of this tragic accident alive. The pilot, 40-year-old Sean Allen, is one of the missing. The photograph of the pilot in company livery appeared on the TV screen. We may never know what happened on this pleasure trip, or how a routine flight could have gone so terribly wrong. The picture changed to a large, modern room. People were sitting, theatre-style, facing a long table. A voiceover announced that they were going live now to a press conference at Northumbria Police Headquarters in Newcastle. A young woman entered the room, followed by two tall men. The one at the back was massive, six foot three or four at least, and wide at the shoulders. His skin was very dark, his hair black and curly. He looked Mediterranean, possibly North African. He sat down behind a sign that read Superintendent Ajax Maldonado. The man in front, the acting chief constable, wore a uniform that gleamed with polished metal and insignia. His hair was short and not quite completely grey. His face was finely cut, handsome, his eyes dark brown. He sat, thanked everyone for coming, and glanced down at some notes. The sound of her mug landing heavily on the tabletop momentarily caught the café's attention. I regret to inform you that at first light this morning... My team recovered the body of 15-year-old Poppy Colton from the crash site. The acting chief constable began, as people around her turned back to the TV screen. An initial examination suggests that she died instantly. That brings to 11 the total number of fatalities arising from yesterday's tragic crash. Our thoughts are with the families of the victims, all of whom have been informed. Are you still hopeful of finding survivors? Of course we're hoping for survivors, but the severity of the crash and the injuries sustained by the eleven people who lost their lives means that we have to be cautious and realistic. Are you widening the search area? This time the senior officer indicated that his superintendent should speak. We're tracking the likely course of the balloon from its takeoff site near St Boswell's to where it eventually came down, Maldonado said. The company are helping us do this. It's an imprecise science, though, because the exact movement of the wind is difficult to predict and to reconstruct. A man in a grey suit at the back of the room bobbed to his feet. Is it true that someone else was strapped into the pilot seat when the balloon came down, suggesting that the pilot was no longer on board? There is no pilot seat as such, Maldonado told him. But we are considering the possibility that the pilot left the balloon some time before it crashed, and that lack of an experienced pilot was a primary factor in the disaster. A woman at the front raised her hand. Can you suggest why the pilot would leap out of a hot air balloon? Maldonado stared directly back at her. No, I can't, 
So you've no clue as to why this happened? Maldonado frowned. It's too early to say, and I'm not about to speculate. A man in the second row raised a microphone. What about the other missing passenger? Maldonado glanced at the acting chief constable and paused a beat before taking the question himself. The other missing passenger is 36-year-old Jessica Lane of York. She was on board the balloon with her sister. In the cafe, she slid lower in the seat. The man at the back was up on his